Talk Radio. The Chiamo Apura Kanu Apura Kaitlu Neye Akango Nanasom Da Midinde Ojirapo Kwesi Radnehem Buta Aka Akwamumai Maruka Etibimu Ojirapo that means greetings to all Apura Kani Apura Kaitni people meaning Africans, black people today is Akanfo Nanasom Day, ancient, authentic. Akan Ancestral Religion Day. My name is Ojirapo Kwesi Radnehembuta Akan. Ojirapo of the Akwamu Nation in North America. Yet I say we thank you once again for tuning in. We are opening up the chat room right now um, for individuals on the phone line. If you have a question or a comment, uh, just hit the number one on the phone line so that we can see that your hand is raised. If you have a question or a comment in the chat room, you must log in as a user in order to interact in the chat room. And we're going to put some links in the chat room right quick for the documents that we will be going over tonight. So the first one, Ankh, the origin of the term yoga. So when you go to the Nhoma link on the website, you will, you, you can, that's, that's the publications page on the website, but then you can go through the publications, you'll see, you scroll down, you'll see Ankh, the origin of the term, yoga, kara, kasa, the origin and nature of the chakra. So that's one particular text. And then we're going to also have the specific text um, in Samayin Kalm and the Seven Senses. So we'll put a link to that in the chat room as well as one of our articles. And for individuals who are new to the program, to the broadcast, we have three broadcasts on a weekly basis on Joada, we have Mondays, we have Akan Fo Nanasom, ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion, where we focus specifically on the Akan expression of Afurakani, Afurai Kaitni, or African ancestral religion, on Benada or Abenada, which is Tuesdays. We have Ojira, which means purification. So on the Ojira broadcast, we deal with Nanasom or Apurakani, Apuraikaitni, ancestral religion in general, showing how it impacts every aspect of our lives from moment to moment, day to day, month to month, year to year, and so forth. We deal with texts from ancient Kemet. We deal with texts and ritual practices, Apuraka, Apuraikaitni, and wherever our people have migrated anywhere in the world, including those of us who were forced to migrate to the Western Hemisphere during the Musuo Kessie, the great perversity of the enslavement era. Although we were forced to migrate, we maintained our ancestral religion, Nana Song, and through the maintenance of Nana Song, it is those who maintained Nana Song who waged war against the whites and their offspring and brought the end to enslavement in South America, in the Caribbean, in Central America, and also in North America. We went into detail about that in our broadcast, Nanasom Apurakani Apurakaiti, Ancestral Religion and the Defeat of Slavery. We also had a two-part broadcast, Independent Apurakani Apurakaiti Communities, Part 1. And then we had the Gullah Wars, Independent Apurakani Apurakaiti Communities, Part 2, where we talked about how it was our people who maintained our Apurakani, Apurakaitni, or African ancestral religious practices, those individuals were motivated and guided by the Abosong, the forces in nature, and the Nananon Nsaman for the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors to rise up, wage war against the whites and their offspring, the slavers, kill them, burn down plantations, free our people, and continuously wage war until we brought down the enslavement system in this hemisphere. So we deal with that on Ojira purification. And as we say, Ojira purification operationalizes 
not our song, Apurakani, Apurakani, Ancestral Religion. On uh, Awukuda, or Akuada Wednesdays, we have uh, Egwa Marketplace. This is where we showcase Apurakani, Apurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions who are serving the Apurakani, Apurakani community in a positive capacity, but also convey our Apurakani, Apurakani ancestral religious values in the process. So we've had a number of individuals come on. Um, in the midst of that uh, process, we have developed our Okom economic development model. We're dealing with economic development and the approach to economic development, short-term, mid-term, and long-term, rooted in Apurakani, Apuraikaini ancestral religious philosophy and culture. So the Okom economic development model you can download that directly from our Ocom page on our website. We also have an Ocom Economic Development Model uh, page on Facebook as well, which you can check out. Um, and we just placed the link in the chat room. The Ocom Economic Development Model, you can download that model, study the model from the page. Of course, it's a free download. Uh, you can also listen to our four-part series on the model that we did on Blog Talk, we saved those videos to the webpage so you can see parts one, two, three, and four, where we dissect the model, showing how it uh, impacts every aspect of our lives. And then you can also look at the various businesses, organizations, and institutions. We are targeting one business organization or institution per week for 52 weeks. We are on week number 16, so we've already supported 15 Apuraikani, Apuraikani businesses, organizations, and institutions as a community. And all Apuraikani, Apuraikani people are encouraged to do so. We are targeting one per week so for uh, optimal capital infusion. And our approach is to starve the beast and feed the pride. That is the methodology or the strategy that we use within the Okom economic development model simply meaning that you make an assessment on a weekly basis to determine what funds you would have potentially wasted with the whites and their offspring, and you starve that beast and feed the pride. You take those funds that you would have spent at white business, businesses, organizations, institutions, retail outlets, Starbucks and McDonald's and these various places, and you starve that white beast and feed the pride. Reallocate those funds to the business of the week. And if you simply reallocated $10 or $15 or $20 in the course of one week away from a white business or organization and towards the feeding of the pride, starving the beast and feeding the pride, then that money goes directly to a black business. If 1,000 people did that, then $20,000 has been reallocated from a white business to a black business that's actually serving our community in a positive capacity allowing the business to expand, to hire within the community, and to serve us at a greater capacity. So we starve the beast and feed the pride. So when you go to the Ocom Economic Development uh, page on our website, you'll see the various businesses that we have listed, and the list of businesses is growing. Um, you'll also so you have links directly to their website so that you can see them and, and uh, support them. You'll also see the links to their interviews that they did with us on the Egua Marketplace show. So you can listen to them, talk about their business, how they founded their business, talk about their background and so forth, and how they utilize ancestral culture and philosophy to inform their approach to serving our community. So all of that information is on the page, and we will be posting a link to um, who is going to be the business of the week this week. We'll post that tomorrow. All right. So. So getting back to, um, so for tonight, Akan Fodana Son, Ancient Authentic, Akan Ancestral Religion. So we deal with um, specifically on Joada on Monday nights, the Akan expression of Nana Son, first and foremost, because we are Akan, so of course that is our particular expression. But of course, Akurakani, Akurakani, Ancestral Religion, African Ancestral Religion at root is the same across the board because all ancestral religion, no matter what expression it takes, is in essence the ritual incorporation 
of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. So through ritual, we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. And through ritual, we reject or we repel those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject, to help hate, to repel in order to restore balance to our lives, to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions. So ancestral religion, the term we use as a catch-all term for ancestral religion or akurakani, akuraikaitni, ancestral religion is nanasom. Nanasom or ancestral religion is the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. The expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion. So whether it's Akan, Yoruba, Epe, Basa, Ula, Chokwe, Maasai, no matter what form it takes, even in the Western Hemisphere with Kudu amongst the Akan people in North America, Voodoo amongst the Fon and Epe speaking people in North America, Juju amongst the Yoruba people in North America, Obia amongst the Akan people in Jamaica, and Winti amongst the Akan people in Suriname, and Lukumi amongst the Yoruba people in Cuba, and of course, Vodun amongst the Fon and Epe speaking people in Haiti, as well as um, various forms of tradition. Wherever we have gone, wherever we migrated or were forced to migrate, we still engage the process of incorporating law and restoring balance through ancestral religion. So, um, so we deal with specifically on Monday night the Akan expression of Nanasong, of ancestral religion. So it's Akan from Nanasong. So, of course, number one, because we are Akan, number two, because of the misinformation that's consistently put forward over, the, over a number of years by Akan people in the Western Hemisphere or those who purport to be Akan in the Western Hemisphere or just joined onto something and which is called Akan spirituality or Akan religion and so forth, and they've just joined on, similar to joining a church in a bogus fashion, joining a congregation and perpetuating misinformation about Akan tradition, as well as those individuals on the continent who have been infected with Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, and white culture in general. Those who have been infected are those who infect the knowledge of the culture, the philosophy, and so forth. It doesn't matter if they claim to be priests or priestesses, akomfo or abosomfo. It doesn't matter if they claim to be royal. That means absolutely nothing. Because when you are infected with white culture, you can be a royal, you can be a priest or a priestess, and you will perpetuate nonsense. It's no different than someone becoming physically ill. If you become physically ill, for example, with tuberculosis, it doesn't matter if you're a priest, a priestess, or a royal, if you're still infected and you begin to cough on people, you are afflicting and infecting them. And your title is absolutely meaningless. Until you actually cure yourself and remove the infection, your title means nothing. And Akurakani, Akuraikaiti people, here in the Western Hemisphere, in the Amenti who have awakened, we don't care anything about anybody's title or lineage or none of that foolishness because the only thing we're concerned about is no quade, which is true. And we get that directly from our direct blood ancestresses and ancestors, our Nanano Nsamampo who have been with us since we incarnated into the world and are tied to our blood circles who communicate directly with us and who have been with us since we have been in the Western Hemisphere. That is where our authority comes from. Nobody else. So we're giving real information and correcting the false information coming from Negroes in the West who perpetuate the infection and Negroes on the continent who perpetuate that white infection. So in that vein, we have done a number of series on our Kanto Nana song. One of the series was the series 
on the spiritual organs within Apurakani, Apuraikadi people, talking about our spiritual anatomy. And we talked about the Bra, the divine living energy, called Ba, Nature Kemet, the Kra, the Krawa, the soul, the divine consciousness, called Ka, Nature Kemet, the Hum Hum, the Eh Hum Hum, also called the Eh Hum in ancient Kemet, the spiritual intuition dwelling in the pineal body, the illumination and so forth. Um, we talked about the Sun Tsum, which is the Sahu in ancient Kemet. We talked about the Av and Hati, which is called the Ebba, and the Cham in Akan. We're talking about the heart and the heart-lung complex. We're talking about the spiritual uh, anatomy, the spiritual aspects of these physical regions and organs and organ systems. We talked about the Sunsuma, the hybrid and so forth. So we talked about, and the physical body, of course, so we talked about the spiritual identity, the various spiritual organs of the Apurakani, Apurakani individual. Um, that was a seven-part series. We also dealt with the Akradain boson, the boson that animates the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies which govern the Akan seven-day week. And we went into detail about all of those 11 aboso, because there are actually 11. We published articles on each one of those 11. And then, of course, we did a, a couple of broadcasts. In fact, that was a 12-part series, the introduction, you know, the summary of all of them. And then one by one, we went through. So in 12 weeks, we went through all 11 of them, um, based on the articles that we've already published. Now, what we're going to do tonight, and we were just simply talking about those forces in nature that animate the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that govern the seven-day week, but they also govern our natural cycles. They govern our organs and organ systems and so forth, and we talked about who those divinities are. What we want to do tonight is dealing with those abosom of the seven days of the week. We're showing how they are directly connected and animate the seven kar karu. The term kara karu, plural kara kara, means circle or a cylinder in ancient Kemet. This is where the term kakra or chakra comes from in Sanskrit. So it is not a Sanskrit term. So we're going to get into, first of all, our publication, Ankh, the origin of the term yoga, kara kasa, the origin and nature of the chakra. We did a broadcast on this book previously where we just went through the entire book, but we're going to talk about a certain portions of the book in relationship to what is the nature of the kara, kara the so-called chakra, and then we're going to show the application of who these abosom are and how they're connected to the seven kara, kara, kar, karu. Um, the problem is many of our people have read information written by the whites and their offspring. Some of these individuals call themselves uh, spiritually or spiritualists, master teachers, so-called elders, so-called elderesses, so-called priests, so-called priestesses, so-called metaphysicians, so-called, um, you know, esoteric individuals and all kinds of other pseudo-titles if they were who they claim to be, queen mothers and, and kings and sovereigns and ain't sued and, and all kinds of titles. But if they were that, that they have been purporting and perpetuating themselves to be, then they would have been repeating the misinformation coming from the whites and their offspring. So all of the individuals who have these pseudo lofty titles but yet have been teaching the community for years and for often for decades that the term chakra or yoga comes from Sanskrit, that's clear evidence that they don't know what they're talking about. And when they don't understand that, then you look even further and you scrutinize what they have been teaching all along and you'll find holes in their pseudo-doctrine across the board. So when people come forward with all of these titles and they like to play dress-up, they like to put on shiny clothes and give themselves titles, but they're constantly misinforming people, publishing a lot of books and articles and videos and having retreats and everything else, and been teaching for decades 
calling themselves elders and elders. But yet, they've been misinforming people on basic definitions. Then you begin to scrutinize further, and you'll see that across the board, inside and out, they have been misinforming people, some of them, the majority of them, based on ignorance, insecurity, a fragile ego, arrogance, and so forth. But then you have a percentage of them who are simply agents of the whites and their offspring, and they seek to misinform our people deliberately as agents of the whites and their offspring. So whenever we look at what people are teaching, we never just incorporate it wholesale. Again, just like we don't honor and deal with pseudo titles from individuals on the continent, we don't deal with these pseudo titles that have been made up here in the Western Hemisphere, or if they have been conferred on people in the Western Hemisphere by people from the continent. It still means absolutely nothing. The only thing that's important is what your direct blood ancestresses and ancestors give to you. And if anything that comes from someone else does not comport with what your Nsamapo and the Abosom have given to you, then you reject what these fools have to say and teach. And we need to be scrutinizing everything that we receive and everything that we embrace and, and see and observe. So let's deal with the etymology of the term first, and then we're going to get into the nature of the karu, karu the so-called chakras and so forth, and then we're going to talk about the uh, solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that govern the seven-day week in our common culture, showing that we have that proper standing of what the karu, karu actually are. Okay, so first we're going to go to our publication off the origin of the term yoga. Pull that up right quick. And for the people who came in a little bit later, if you go to the Nhoma page, and we place the link in the chat room, you will find, um, when you go to the Nhoma page, the publications page on our website, you'll see the book. You'll see the front cover of the book. It's probably uh, like the seventh or eighth book down and you'll find that. So we're going to find the page for you right quick. Okay, so first of all, of course, um, as you're reading through the book, the first part of the book deals with Ankh being the origin of the term yoga. So we go into detail about that etymologically. We also show that uh, conceptually and ritually and cosmologically, proving that we utilize that term, the term Ankh itself became yon in the Proto-Indo-European language family, and yonk became yonka and yoga later on, yoke and so forth, but it comes from yonk, onk in ancient Kemet, and this is why you see one of the spellings of the word onk. Onk, of course, means life, but then onk in another definition with a different determinative of a small domesticated animal means the life, meaning the living being, of a small domesticated animal. And when you see that medu and the way it's spelled, you'll see the small domesticated animal, the goat, and it has an onk around its neck in the form of a yoke. That is the union between the term onk, function of yoking, because the life principle is the yoke between the spirit realm and the physical realm. So we're going to detail about that, but we're not going to get too much into that tonight. We're going to go straight down to page because the second part of the book deals with the origin of the term chakra. You get to page 16 in the book. That's the last portion of the first part, and then the second part um, deals with the origin of the term chakra. But we start off here. So, and let me just scroll up right quick. And again, for the individuals who came on a little bit later, if you have a question or a comment in the chat room, just hit the number one. Um, in the, I'm sorry, on the phone line, hit the number one. If you're in the chat room, you must uh, log in with the username in order to um, interact in the chat room. If you don't have a username, you can sign up for one quickly in Blog Talk. All right. Okay, let me just pull this up real quick. All right, so when you look at page 15, you'll see that we start talking about the concept. We say the concept of chakras is typically associated with the pseudo-discipline, quote-unquote, yoga. Again, this term is one stolen from Kemet, 
by the whites and their offspring and co-opted into their pseudo-spiritual practices and cosmology. And then we give two quotes that anybody can find in Wikipedia concerning the etymology of the term chakra. So we give these two quotes because these are very popular and same popular designations, same popular um, definition or etymological origin, pseudo etymological origin that people typically put forward. So in Wikipedia, they will say, the concept of chakra features in tantric and yoga traditions of Hinduism and Buddhism. Its name derives from the Sanskrit word for will or turning, kakram, um, in Hindi, kaka, in Pali, and then they have a few other definitions in Chinese and te, um, Tagalog and uh, Tibetan and other ones. So chakras correspond to vital points in the physical body that are generally understood as being part of the subtle body, which cannot be found through autopsy, while breath channels or nadis of yogic practices have already been discussed in the classical Upanishads, it was not until the 8th century Buddhist Hevajra, Tantra, and Karayakiti that hierarchies of chakras were introduced. That's a very important point. Not until the 8th century. We're talking about the 8th century CE. 8th century of this era that the um, hierarchies of, of chakras were introduced. And then, late, so that's only 1,200 years ago. It's not some ancient practice going back thousands and thousands of years. This is in the 8th century of this era. That's when the concept, according to the whites and their offspring, that hierarchies of chakras were introduced. This is very recent. And then later after that, then you have this notion of colors and so forth being associated with the chakras based on the Europeans associating things with the rainbow and certain deities they learned about ancient Kemet and trying to fuse them together and not really understanding who's who and what's what. But the 8th century CE or quote unquote AD is when hierarchies of chakras were first introduced. Then they give definitions of the term chakra meaning circle. Um, also, also later being connected to a nerve plexus within the body and so forth. And then in Buddhist literature, the Sanskrit term kakra, Pali, pronounced kaka. So in Sanskrit, it's kakra, and Pali is kaka. It's used to, uh, in a different sense of circle, talking about a circle in the sense of a cycle. Of course, they show some of the Proto Indo European roots in Tokarian B. Kokale, which is kokare, dealing with will and so forth, um, a number of different things. So they're saying, number one, Sanskrit is the first time it's mentioned. Some sources will say the earliest mention of chakras, simply meaning will, goes back to the Vedas, which is 1700 BCE to 1100 BCE, so-called. But then as far as chakras being energy centers and hierarchies of chakras and so forth, the eighth century of this era. But even if you go back to the simple term for circle, or in fact, the term circle or kirkko, kirkkuru, kirkkuru is where you get kakra or kakra from. Um, circle in English is where it comes from. Um, this is what they're talking about in the Vedas going back to 1700 BCE, just talking about wheel or circle. That's, those are the mentions they're talking about, the earliest mentions. Then hundreds of years later, over a thousand years later, as a matter of fact, in fact, over 2,000 years later in the 8th century, that's when they start talking about hierarchies of chakras. So if you, the earliest mention of the term kakra, meaning wheel, is in the Vedas of 1700 BC. Well, we can show in the Medusa when we show the actual hieroglyphs from ancient Kemet where the origin of the term actually lies. And this is pre-1700 BC, before the white narrow spring existed. So we show not only does it mean wheel, but kara, kara in ancient Kemet. And we show the Medusa for that. Uh, entry from a hieroglyphic dictionary. Anything round, a staff, a stick, roll, or a cylinder. 
Kara Kara. We, we know the pronunciation for two reasons. Number one, the way it's spelled is the symbol for the ka. It's the first portion, and then which are the two arms raised upward, pointing upward, and Coptic that's pronounced ka. So we have a vocalization there. And then the symbol for the letter R, the rolling R. So kar, kar, we have a vocalization that we can point to. So that's that's one of the entries for ka to car, anything round, staff stick, roll, or cylinder. Then you have kara, kara, again, it means stone boulder. You also have kara, kara, to mark out a circle with a stick. Now, that's very important. First of all, we show the origin of the term. Um, secondly, cosmologically, what is it dealing with with regard to a circle? We go further, you look at the term kar, as well as kara, also means in commit a shrine or a sanctuary. Then the karau, which is plural for kara, karau, means the gods or the deities of a shrine. So karau, karau, or karau is a shrine, karau, a shrine, and then deities within that shrine. And we show an image of the shrine, we show the medutu. So not only is the term kara kara, meaning anything round, a circle, cylinder, and so forth. But then kara also means a shrine. That is very key because we understand the reality of what a kara kara is. These seven centers are seven shrines, seven shrines for the divinity. In Afurakani, Afurakani people, they are relay stations, so to speak, for the energy of the forces in nature to communicate with us and for us to communicate with them. Let's go into the Akan language real quick to give further definition. And what we're going to read from is the Asante Fante Dictionary. Um, uh, the, the specific edition is the 1933 edition, which is an expanded edition. Um, it's over 600 pages and so forth. You can get that Asante Fante Dictionary. You can download the entire 600-plus page dictionary for free at archive.org. Just type in a Santi Fanti dictionary, and you'll see that. So we talked about kara, kara, meaning circle, um, anything circular, round, staff, a cylinder, a row. So then we look at the Akan language, the tree language, and what do we find? Koro, koro, meaning round and small. Koro, koroa means something round, circular, globular, and so forth. The root of koro, koroa is koro, and it means a large, round, flat, wooden vessel. Now there's a variation of that koro, which comes from kara and kara, kara. So we have, just like it's doubled in ancient Kemet, we have a double akan, koro, koroa, and then we also have the singular version, koro, which means something round, flat, and so forth. Same term from ancient Kemet, same term we still use in our con today for the same thing. Then there's another version that you have, the way it's pronounced, instead of koro, kroa, it's kuru, kruwa. Same thing. So let's read that real quick, just so you can get a real quick um, comparison. And we're going to find it. We'll look. Give you the page number real quick. Hold on one second. Okay, look on page 274 of the Asante Fati Dictionary. And that variation, once again, is kuru, kruwa. And similar to koro, kruwa, meaning round and large, a flat and globular thing, circular, globular spherical. Kuru, kruwa, and koro, kroa is the same as kara, kara from ancient Kemet. So we're talking about the same thing. Now, it's very important because kruwa in Akan and kruwa in Akan also means a specific shrine, specific vessel, shrine that is used for offering for deity. 
This is why you have Kara and Karau in ancient Kemet, which is a shrine and a sanctuary for deity. Same thing. Now, and we just want to scroll down real quick and give another piece from this particular article, and then we'll get off that. We just want to show the actual Medutu for that. We go to page 20 um, in the section talking about Karakasa, and we show that as well. So same Medutu, and then we get to the piece dealing with Kasa, because we want to talk about Kasa. So, so we've proven the term Kara Kara comes directly from ancient Kemet, um, and it's still used in Akan today with the exact same meaning, talking about anything that's circular, globular, spherical, round, also a vessel. Um, the Kuro Kuroa in Akan is also a vessel, not only used as a shrine, but also a vessel, a calabash, um, when you carve out the insides of a gourd, and now you have a vessel that you can carry, um, whether it's water or utilize it for libation, utilize it for shrine work and so forth, you have a vessel. So these little circular um, shapes or spheres within us, these spherical, circular, globular um, regions within us are vessels, literally. They are shrines, literally, and they are circular, all kara kara. Now, we call it kara kasa, the origin and nature of the chakra, but now we're going to talk about the term kasa. A quote from one of the first texts written in the West regarding the chakra. And this is on page 21 of our book. Quote, the Hindu books hint at rather than explain what happens when kundalini rises up the channel through the sushumna. They refer to the spine as merudanda, the rod of meru, the central axis of creation, presumably of the body. Because in this text, he, they're assuming that this is what the rod of meru is, the central axis of creation, and they believe it also means the central axis of the body. In that, they say there is a channel called sushumna in your central axis of your body. Within that channel, the sushumna, within that channel is another called Vajrini. And within that, again, a third channel called Chitrini, which is as fine as a spider's thread. Upon that are threaded the chakras, like knots on a bamboo rod. So that is from the book, The Chakras by C.W. Ledbetter, 1927. So within the sushumna, which is a spiritual um, channel going up and down your spine and so forth, inside of that, they say is a, a small thread, the, the cheek rini, which is as fine as a spider's thread, a thread of energy, quote unquote. And upon that thread are threaded the chakras like not on a bamboo rod. Now, what is the, the rod of Meru? the central axis of creation and the central axis in the body. Who is Meru? Well, the white Tanaro spring in India corrupted that from the deity of ancient Kemet called Menu or Men, often spelled M-I-N by the white Tanaro spring, it's really M-E-N and M-E-N-U, Menu. And this is where they get Meru, Meru Danda, the rod of Meru. Men, or sometimes shown as Amen Men or Amen Menu, it's where they get metal from. You'll see that his crown, on the crown, he has a red ribbon from the back of the crown dropping all the way behind him, all the way to the ground. That is because the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal column, that is the central axis of the body. That is the rod, literally, of the divinity, Menu, which is the white snarl spring in India called Meru, and that is the central axis of the body. In our Khan culture, of course, Amen Men is the divinity of Amen Menne Da, the day Da of Amen Men, which is Saturday. That is the same divinity. We still call him Amen or Amen Men today, just like we call him Amen Men in ancient Kemet. In fact, the term Amen Menne in our Khan is one of the terms for brain. This is why the crown of Amen Men 
with the ribbon going down the back is the same as the central nervous system. It is in the same form because amin mini governs the brain, and that's why amin mini means the brain in the Akan link. And it's visual, you know, pic, uh, pictorially you can see that with the crown of amin min, it is the central nervous system. It's the brain and spinal column. We show that image on page 21. What's important about that is when they talk about the chakras being uh, knotted and tied to that channel up and down the spinal column or that axis, like knots on a bamboo rod. What is the term for knots in ancient Kemet? If you look at the term for knots in ancient Kemet, it's kas or kasa, and we show them a do for that, a knot, a tie, a ligature. It also means backbone. It also means vertebrae. So now in the Hindu text, they say those chakras are tied like a knot on a bamboo rod up and down the energy of the spine. And then the term for a knot in ancient Kemet is kasa, but it's also the term for backbone. It's also ter the term for vertebrae and spine. And it's called kas or kasa, and we show the medutu for that. And then Coptic is kas and so forth. Then we show one of the entries in the Hieroglyphic Dictionary, the kasu seven, the seven magical knots that protected a man. These are the seven knots along the spine. The other kasu seven in the Pert Emheru, so-called Book of the Dead, Pert Emheru, the Book of Coming Forth by Day, the seven deities who assisted at the judgment and condemnation of the wicked in ancient Kemet. Then you have the term kas or kasa, meaning a chamber or a room. Kas or kasa, meaning a sarcophagus or a funerary coffin. These are chambers, rooms, sanctuary, dealing with the shrine. Not only does it mean not, but it also means shrine. These are the not along um, spiritual spine or the rod of Meru, or the rod of Menu. The same as Karakara, a different descriptive title for these chambers up and down the spine, and seven of them delineated in ancient command. But we have another definition. Kas, or kasa meaning master or chief. Kasit, meaning female, chief chiefness, and so forth. Kasa, meaning um, bodies of soldier, fighters, and so forth. The seven knots along the spine are shrines of energy. They are masters, chiefs, chieftainesses, fighters, repelling negative energy and so forth, and we're going to get into that. We just want to show these definitions. Um, but also, kas and kasa also mean proverb, a saying, a formula, a charm, a spell, an incantation, declaration, statement, what a man wants to say, I'm talking about ritual speech, kasa. And you find another definition of kasa, speeches, proverbs, precepts, statements, charms, spells, orders, commands. Then kasa, plural, kasau, meaning lawmakers, arrangers, disposers, managers, regulator of law. So we're talking about the seven knots on the spine, not is kasa. They are um, shrines of sanctuary, kasa. They carry energy. They are masters, kasa. They deal with incantations, ritual spells, ritual projections of divine living energy to affect matter. Kasa. Regulators of divine law, lawmakers, arrangers. Kasa. And then we talk about ritual prayer, ritual incantations that's dealing with what they would call mantric and so forth, utilizing sound vibrations to affect uh, reality. And then you also have the term Kasi means to raise, to lift up, to raise oneself, to ascend, to ascend a hill and so forth. Various forms of the term kas or kasi meaning to raise, to rise, to mount, to ascent. Of course, we're talking about the ascent up the spine of these seven knots. So all of these meanings of kas, kasa, dealing with the, shrine, the, the knots, dealing with the sanctuaries, the shrines, the chambers, dealing with regulating order, dealing with incantation, dealing with raising up or making an ascent or lifting up or rising up, all having to do with the seven centers along the spine and raising energy within these seven centers.
which is all from ancient Kemet, before the white snarl spring even entered into India. It has nothing to do with the white snarl spring entering India. It has nothing to do with Sanskrit at all. This is pre-Sanskrit, pre-Aryan. And then you have the Kasa or Kasau Uru, a group of deities who raised the dead, talking about the raising of quote unquote consciousness, raising, awakening, raising up certain ancestral spirits from death or dormancy and more. Now, let's get directly into the physical body. If the kara kara or the kakra or the chakra, meaning the seven spherical globular centers, the circular center, the shrines, the vessel um, that carry energy are also called kasa, meaning knots, kasa, meaning arrangers, kasa, meaning shrines, kasa, meaning ritual incantations, and so forth, up and down the spine. But let's look at specifically, physiologically, what are the seven kasa or seven knots in the physical body? Well, you have what we call nerve ganglia, which is a mass, a knot of nerve cells, and the plexuses are a network or a knot of spinal nerves. So we show a picture of the seven kasa, plural kasau, knots within the body, the seven nerve plexuses or collections of nerve ganglia, literally seven knots or masses of nerve ending in the same positions that correspond to the so-called seven karu. But the key is when we, we said not in ancient Kemet, kasa, we're literally talking about not up and down those regions that correspond to those regions of the spine. And this is why we call them knots, but we also call them chambers. We also call them, um, using that terminology for raising up, also using that terminology for ritual incantation. But to go further, we want to find it in the text already incorporated into ritual, showing that this is part of the culture and not just some concept that we picked up from somewhere else. So if you look in Chapter 71 of the Pert Imheru, the so-called Book of the Dead, over 3,600 years ago, this particular papyrus, we quote from Chapter 71, O you seven knots, the arms of the balance on that night of setting the sacred eye in order the divine eye in order, who cut off heads, who sever necks, who take away hearts, who make a slaughter in the island of fire. I know you, I know your name. May you know me just as I know your name. If I reach you, may you reach me. If you live through me, may I live through you. May you make me to flourish with what is in your hand the staff, spine, which is in your grass. So this is chapter 71. The person is identifying and invoking the divinities of the seven chambers, the seven knots, and calls them the seven knots, the seven kasu, the seven knots within the spirit body. He identifies with the divinities that animate them. He says, if I may reach you, may you reach me. If you live through me, May I live through you, showing that we are living through these seven centers of energy. May you make me to flourish. So the harmony of these seven knots, just like physiologically, your nerve plexi, plexus and your, or nerve plexi, rather, the various um, plexi or plexuses, so to speak, throughout your body. If your nerves are out of harmony with order, then you're going to have problems nerve damage and so forth, but when they're in harmony with order, then you're functioning and moving and operating properly. Your organs are working properly and so forth. In the same fashion, in your spirit body, if these centers are out of harmony with order, then you are going to be spiritually disaligned. So he's saying, may you make me to flourish, meaning when he aligns with these forces in nature that dwell and operate through these seven regions, then he can flourish. He says, may you make me to flourish with what is in your hand. What is in their hands? He says, the staff or the spine which is in your grasp. So he's saying these seven knots have grasped the spine. These are the seven knots upon the bamboo rod. Now, there's a further portion of that text. It says, may you 
destined me to life annually. Every year, destined me to life. May you grant to me many years of life over and above my years of life. Many days over and above my days of life. Many nights over and above my nights of life until I depart. So throughout my life, may you make me to flourish day and night, year after year. The final portion of this text, may I rise to be a likeness of myself. May my breath be at my nose. May my eyes see in company with those who are in the horizon on that day of dooming the robber. The key here is, number one, may I rise to be a likeness of myself. This is talking about the rising of the energy that stimulates every one of these shrines within our spirit body. May my breath be at my nose. The rising is dependent upon the breath at the nose. And of course, we see the abosom, the divinity, placing the ankh at the nose to enliven, to ankh the person. May my eyes see in the company with those who are in the horizon. Once you are enlivened with that energy, your, the nose, of course, bringing in the breath, the divine purified energy of life, causing you to rise. And he says, may I rise to be a likeness of myself. May my breath be at my nose, connecting the breath with the rising of that energy. May my eyes be see in company with those who are in the horizon, meaning now he can see that the illumination of the quote-unquote first eye or third eye so that he can see with those who are in the horizon on the day of dooming the robber, meaning he's destroying the criminal, destroying disorder, so he can see like those who are in the horizon. He is illuminated and can attune to the forces of nature, the abosom, as well as the nananom and samapha, who are called aku and aku to nature commit the illumined ones or the shining ones. Now, this is why we say, here the spirits of the seven kasa or kasau are appealed to ritually for the elevation and recalibration of the individual spirit. This is evidence of the seven kara, kara system or the kasa system, the seven knots, fully incorporated in ritual thousands of years before the whites and their offspring had any knowledge of its existence. Now, we wanted to deal with that just to prove comes from. And then, of course, the descriptive title of kasa meaning not. If the so-called elders and so-called eldresses, people who call themselves or fancy themselves master teachers, so-called priests, so-called priestesses, giving themselves titles of queen, mothers and kings, and, and whether they're from the continent or here, if they have not taught you this, then they don't know what they're talking about. And they have not taught you this. So when people gather these foolish little titles, yet they're misinforming you for decades, then you have to open your eyes. This is information, of course, that has always been in the text of Kemet that these people claim to have read, yet they've been misinforming you talking about yoga. The term yoga as well as chakra comes from India. They have no knowledge of where it actually comes from. So we're going to get into some more detail because just like he says in the text, um, may my eyes see in the company with those who are in the horizon. Now you're in the horizon, and now your eyes are open, and you can see. You want to observe and see what's foolishness and what is real. These, this information has been in these texts for thousands of years, and these people have these texts in their homes, in their libraries, even claim to be teaching from these texts. So why didn't they see these seven knots in the text if they're a so-called queen mother or, or a so-called Aung Su? This is what you need to ask. And then you reject that nonsense and get, in, get to something real. Connect with your own ancestresses and ancestors. Let them be the elders and eldresses who guide you to proper information, not some pseudo-egomaniac, male or female. All right. So now we're talking about the chakras, kara kara, being shrined. Now we want to get to information dealing with the abosom of the seven days of the week. 
and their association. Okay, and before we get to that, I just want to make sure we didn't miss anything in the chat room right quick. Okay, I thought I saw a couple of things. We just want to make sure we didn't miss anything. Okay, so there was a question. Would it be correct to say that the Achiwadiefo, which is the term for, we use in, in the language, um, spiritual, spirits of disorder, those who are taboo, divinely hated, Etu wadie means taboo. Chi means to hate. Adie means thing, object, deed, or entity. So etu wadie in Akan means those things, object, deeds, or entities that are divinely prohibited, which are so-called taboo, hated by the Abosong. For example, child molestation is etu wadie, taboo. It is divinely hated. Murder is hated. Rape is hated. Of course, this sexuality, homosexuality is hated. But then we call the whites in our spring etu wadie fo, meaning the group of people fo. Well, actually, spirits of disorder and divinely hated, divinely rejected by cancer itself. So when they say the question, would it be correct to say that the Achiwadie flow took what was sacred to us, whereas we were communing with our ancestresses and ancestors and started using the word tantric yoga positioning and say that it is more of a corrupted sexual sort of yoga, yoga created by the Hindu? Um, well, what they did was, of course, the same tradition, the same invocation of the Yaboso that we engaged on the continent thousands of years ago, that we engage on the continent today, that we utilize in the Western Hemisphere. Spirit possession, pouring libation, ritual song, ritual dance, trance possession, and so forth, um, all these various ritual practices that we engage in today in Hudu and Voodoo and Juju and Obia in the Western Hemisphere, and Lukumi and so forth, and, um, and the Congo tradition, and the Gullah Geechee traditions and so forth, the same traditions we practice on the continent are the exact same traditions we carry into the so-called Near East and into um, India. The exact same tradition. Meditation is only one gateway to the ancestral realm. Susu Ha, or meditation is one gateway to the ancestral realm. It's a cool gateway. Ritual dance is a fiery gateway to the ancestral realm where somebody's dancing and spinning and then they propel, their spirits propelled into the ancestral realm where possession takes place. Ritual, ritual song is another gateway. Edjum song is a gateway, a more cool, watery form of a gateway to the ancestral realm, the spirit realm. Ritual prayer is a gateway to the spirit realm. So these are different gateways with their different energy complexes. Some people will enter into the realm of the Nsamanfo and Abo, some through ritual dance, some through ritual song, some through ritual prayer, some through um, susuho, meditation, um, various things. Some through kabomu, which is ritual procreative activity with your spouse. Of course, it's only an Afurakani male, Afurakani female. No dissexuality, no interracialism, none of that nonsense. So um, that's another gateway to the spirit realm, opening the gateway so you can move into the spirit realm and communicate. These are different gateways. And we participate in these various gateways. At some point, some people are more um, inclined towards one or more of those gateways than, than the other. Some people are more inclined towards ritual dance to propel them into the ancestral realm, whereas other people are more inclined towards ritual prayer. prayer. Uh, some people are more inclined towards um, ritual song and so forth. But at some point, we engage all of them um, at some point. So when we carry this same ancestral religious practice with these various gateways to the Abosom, to the Insamanfo, um, that included Kabomu, which is ritual sexual activity with your spouse. Uh, rich, we talked about this last week, ritual procreative activity. When someone, when you're married, your spouse, um, you are either engaged in procreative activity to bring an ancestral spirit back into the world, to conceive and bring one of our in some info, male or female ancestresses and ancestresses, ancestors or ancestresses back into the world, or you're engaged in ritual procreative activity to align yourself with the abosom, align yourself with the insamanfo, no different than 
meditation, no different than ritual song, no different than ritual dance, no different than ritual prayer, and so forth. So it's one or the other. And, of course, either way, whether you're bringing an ancestral spirit back into the world or you're bringing an ancestral spirit or their energy into your sphere of awareness to realign you and your spouse um, through ritual appropriative activity, either way, it's a sacred practice. So, of course, we did that on the continent. We do that here. We did that in when we migrated into India. The whites and their offspring observed what we were doing and, of course, deliberately corrupted that practice um, and took fragments of it. Of course, they can't communicate with the forces of nature. They can sit down and meditate forever, and no deity will possess them. No deity will communicate with them, whether they're a white Hindu, whether they're a white American, whether they're a white European, whether they're an Asian, whether whether they are a pseudo-Native American who are just white Asian spirits of disorder who invaded this hemisphere when our people were already in this hemisphere. No divinity has ever nor will ever communicate with these spirits of disorder, the the whites and their offspring. So they can do all kinds of ritual, and they will never have any contact. The only spirit they will be able to contact is their discarnate, wayward, disordered, deceased relatives and other non-related deceased who are spiritually disordered as well. And that's the most that they can communicate with. So they saw what we were doing and imitated what we were doing, just like fragments of what we were doing, just like the Greeks. When they invaded Kemet, they began to dress like us. You see the Greek reliefs and you see the sculptures, and then later the Romans. You'll see them all of a sudden now they're wearing um, Kemeti headdresses. They're standing in the same postures. They're giving themselves um, names from Kemet. They're calling themselves Meri Amen and Meri Patah, talking about their children of Patah, Amen, and everything else, which is pure nonsense, imitating everything that we were doing but corrupting it at the same time, bringing homosexuality, trying to enshrine that as part of the culture, which is really their perverse, insane, polluted culture and so forth. But they were imitating what we were doing. Those descendants of those white Greeks, white Arabs, white Europeans and so forth, are doing the exact same thing today. The descendants of the people of ancient Hanat, Nubian, Kemet, who manifest as Akan or Yoruba or Fon and Ebe, those who are brainwashed, who try to allow the white canal spring to participate in ritual. You'll see these white Greeks, white Hindu type crackers, these white Western Europeans and Eastern Europeans and so forth, invading the culture, calling themselves white Hispanics, calling themselves white Latinos, white Latinas, as as well as others. They, quote, unquote, embrace the Yoruba tradition, take on Yoruba names, call themselves children of Obatala and children of Oshun and Ogun and everything else. These are the same white, perverse, cis-sexual Greeks and Romans and Arabs and others who have reincarnated through their descendants, and they're imitating and polluting our culture just like they're um, just like they did when they were here living on earth in the past and their relatives did in the past in ancient Kemet when the Greeks and Romans did the same thing. The same thing happened in India. The white Aryans watching what our people were doing, imitating what our people were doing, corrupting fragments of it, and then putting it forward as uh, yogic discipline, corrupting it all along the way. So when they talk about Tantra, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. When they're talking about yoga or meditation or ritual practice or yantras or mudras or anything else, nothing to do with what we're talking about. We're always in communication with the Aposon, the actual forces that animate creation. They cannot communicate with them. And we're also communicating with our nananom samampo, our spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, as well as the kra, which is the soul, the divinity that dwells in our head region, which they do not have. So the only thing they can communicate with is their deceased, perverse relatives and non-relatives, and then they build a philosophy around communicating with those perverts or a philosophy around surrounding communicating with absolutely nothing, seeking to escape the cycle of reincarnation, attuning to the abyss and saying the deities are unimportant because they're not spiritually cultivated and we don't need to follow any deities to achieve enlightenment and all this stupidity. That kind of foolish philosophy comes from their inferiority. 
because they have no capacity to communicate with the forces of divine order. They have no capacity to communicate with Amen and Aminette. So they have to build a philosophy around not communicating with anything, not because it's true um, and, and sound as a philosophical approach, but because it's based on and it betrays their impotence spiritually. So this is what they're doing. All right, so let's get into the connection between the Akradim Bosan in the Akan tradition. Give me one second. Okay, so um, I'm going to put a link. You can go to the Akradim Bosan page on the website, and we'll put the link in the chat room right quick. So when you go to the Akradim Bosom page on the website, find that we have an introduction dealing with the nature of the Akradim Bosom, the Abosom, the forces in nature. In our Khan culture, we call them Abosom. Um, Yoruba, they call them Orisha. Um, in ancient Kemet, typically called Ntoro and Ntoro to the divinities, but that term Ntoro is also used in the Akan language as well. In fact, Bosom comes from Bosu, in ancient Kemet, which is the title of divinity. So it's the same term. Okay, and give me one second. Hold on one second. I need to make an adjustment right quick. All right, so the term Bosum comes from Bosum in ancient Kemet. And we have an article talking about the origin of the term Bosum in ancient Kemet, proving that. Um, so the Akradim Bosom is a specific grouping of Abosom. The divinities, the forces in nature, the spirit forces in nature, the male and female spiritual forces in nature, the goddesses and gods, the divinities, the deities who animate the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies which govern the seven-day week. Akan people using the seven-day week, we've been using this seven-day week for thousands of years. Akan people, of course, come from ancient Kana, or the Kani land, which is the title of Nubia. So this is why in Akan culture, when Akan people are asked, what does the term Akan mean? Why do you refer to yourself as Akan Fo, meaning the group of people Fo, who are Akan, that's plural. Akan Ni is one Akan person, Akan Fo, is Akan people in the plural and so forth. Why do we refer to ourselves as Akan? Because the root Khan means first or foremost, meaning the first people, a component part of the first people to exist in the world. And then Khan also means to calculate or to reckon, to count or to reckon, to calculate. We are a component part of the first people to engage in calculation, measuring, reckoning, the foundation of civilization. So when you look in ancient Kanat, Nubia, you look in the language of ancient Kanat and Kemet, the term Khan means first, foremost, from the beginning, land of the south, the front land, the foremost land. That's why the title of Nubia is Kanat, or the Kani land, meaning the front land, or the foremost land, or the first land. But then Khan also means to count, to reckon, to calculate. So it's the same term with the same meaning. And then the people themselves are called Kani people and Kani too. And we still call ourselves Akani with the exact same meaning. Of course, that is culturally, we find that linguistically, we find that, of course, Akan people worship the same deities with the same names from ancient Kemet. Every Akan person, as we will see tonight, is named after one of these divinities. Every Akan person, as soon as they're born, immediately named after one of these divinities from ancient Kemet today. Um, that can also be shown genetically with regard to um, our chromosomal haplogroups and so forth. So for this archaeologically, um, linguistically, and genetically, we are the same people who migrated from these regions. We also migrated, some of our people migrated north of Kana, Nubia, to establish ancient Kemet. We were a component part of that civilization. And of course, the Yoruba and Ebe and other people were there as well. People from the Congo, 
we were all part of a larger group. And you'll find that term con, for example, in Yoruba means fur as well, the same root. You'll find it in the Congo and everything else. So we were all part of that founding civilization. Some of our people migrated north to establish Kemet. Before it was called Kemet, before it was called Ha Meri, it was called Khan or Kanu, the interior, the first or foremost land. And then later it became called Kemet, meaning the black country. And of course, it dealt with the black soil, but also the people themselves, the black people, Kamau, as well as when you look outside of the black land, you'll see Desheru, the red land, and the people, the Desheru, the shirt meaning red land, and Desheru, the red people. Of course, we've proven that means dark brown people with black undertones for the Kamau, dark brown people with red undertones for the Desheru. But we also migrated further north to establish Kanana, which is the white snarl spring called Cain. When you look at the deities of ancient Kanana, these are the exact same deities from ancient Kana. Prior to the white snarl offspring invading, prior to the white snarl offspring learning about the culture, prior to the white snarl offspring eventually taking fragments of the culture and manufacturing a pseudo religion of Hebrewism and later Islam and Christianity and all of that nonsense and these mythical cartoon characters who never existed Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Moses. Jesus, Solomon, Sheba, all of these characters never existed of any form or of any, any form or of any race whatsoever. Yahweh, of course, a fictional cartoon character. Allah, a fictional cartoon character. But before the White Nile Spring invaded and manufactured these corruptions based on the names and titles of deities from Kemet, the people of ancient Kanana were in that region. When you see their sarcophagi, their, you know, coffins and so forth, they are in the form of ancient Kemet, of course, ancient Kemet. That was part of the empire they were ruling all the way up into, through Kanana, all the way up into Syria. And this is why you'll find Stele to Amin-Ra in Syria. So that entire strip that is today's Palestine and Israel and Lebanon and Syria and everything else, for a while, People of ancient Kemet were ruling that area. And of course, when we carried our culture into those regions, we carried our language into those regions, we carried our, you know, traditional practices into those regions. So you'll see the deity from ancient Kemet manifest. You'll see the relief. If you were to see a relief from ancient Kanana and a relief from ancient Kemet, they're sitting sideways, same positions, same headdresses, and so forth, just on the first observance you wouldn't know the difference between whether or not it was from Kemet or Kanana because we're talking about the same people. We also went into so-called, what would later be called Sumer and Elam. And later Sumer becomes the Akara or Akkadian Akara Empire prior to Sumer becoming, you know, um, the Akkadian Empire and then the White Snow Spring invading that region. They would say, well, prior to the so-called proto-Semitic invaders, the people in ancient Sumer or Akara were speaking a non-Semitic language. They like to say, well, it was a non-Semitic language before the Semitic language came in. Well, what is a non-Semitic language? Because there's a non-Semitic language and a non-Indo-European language. What's left? Of course, it's an Afurakani, Afurakani language, so-called Niger-Congo language. But they don't want to say that because then that proves that the people of ancient Sumer where they consider the origin of the world according to the pseudo-mythology of the Bible, the Tigris and Euphrates and Mesopotamia and all of that, they will say that's where the Garden of Eden was and that's the beginning of the world. But if, then if they say that Sumer was an ancient Afurakani, Afurakani civilization, and we know the Sumerians were people who descended from ancient Kanat, Nubia, and so forth, they say that, and that destroys the Bible and the Quran and the Talmud and everything else. So they'll just use a sleight of hand and say, well, the people spoke a non-Semitic language and a non-Indo-European language. And it was an ancient, archaic civilization before the proto-Semitic people invaded. That's all sleight of hand. That proto-language was the language of our people. Same people who migrated north to Kanana, same people migrated into 
so-called Sumer, later Akara, which is still Akana, and so forth. Now, um, it is there where you'll find us fully utilizing that seven-day wait, the Akara Empire. And if, even before the White Narrow Spring invade, we've established that seven-day week, and White Narrow Spring invade, they learn about that, and they continue with that seven-day week as well. And this is where the whites and their offspring learned about the seven-day week. But we continued that practice. And we still have that practice amongst the Akan people in West Afrika, Afrika, and of course, it's all over the world. Now, there are deities that govern the solar lunar, or animate the solar lunar and planetary bodies that govern the seven-day week. Of course, you can read those ancient texts from Afurakani, Afurakani people in ancient Sumer before the invasion of the White Sonar Spring. But those same solar lunar and planetary bodies are the same ones that govern the Akan seven day week today, and we have these same divinities that govern them, and we are named after them. Our, we have Akradin, or soul name. That means when we're born on a specific day, because of the relationship we have with the Abosom that we have forged over thousands of years, the way they communicate that relationship to us is that they make sure we are born on the day of the Abosom that was assigned to us pre-incarnation. So, for example, Tuesday is Benada or Abenada, the day da of Bena. Bena is Herubedat, Herubena, so-called Behudet or Bedet also called Benet in Akan, the divinity that operates through the planet Bena, so-called Mars, Herakuti, um, the Abosom of Fire, hot metal, war, enforcer of divine order, raising war against the enemy, the divine immune system in the great divine body of the Supreme Being, and therefore operates through the immune system of Afurakani, Afurakani people. And Abena is the female force of divine Immunity as well. This is Sechima, as she's called in Akan, is Sechima and Ejigamet, Sekhmet, um, operates through that same planet, fiery, warrioress of war, fire, killing the enemy, destroying disorder for the maintenance of the integrity of divine order. So this, if someone, if a male is born, for example, or assigned to that divinity pre-incarnation by the Supreme Being, before we incarnate into a womb, we are drawn to Nyame Wa Nyame, the great mother and great father, as they are called in our Khan culture, Aminet and Amen. And we have an article about Nyame, is really Oniyame or Oni Ame, the same divinity. And Oniyame Wa is Ani Ame Wa Aminet, from ancient Kemet. So um, we're drawn to them. They assign a cross a soul of divine consciousness to us, a divinity that dwells in our head region, and they assign us a specific abosom to govern that crowd, to govern our head. If you are assigned to the abosom benna, who is called benna in Akan, bedat in ancient Kemet, ogun in the Yoruba tradition, ogu in Bodun, same divinity. If you are assigned to him, benna in Akan culture, and your kra is governed by him, your soul is governed by him, your head is governed by him, then you will, Benna will make sure that you come out of the womb on Benna Da, or the day, the Da of Benna, which is Benna Da, which is Tuesday. So you're born on Tuesday, you will be called Kwa Benna, because this is a child who is a subject, Kwa, of the Abosom Benna, Kwa and he was born on Benada, so this is why sometimes they will call the soul name, the Kradin, the soul's name. They will also call it a day name because, oh, he was born on Benada, that means he's associated with the deity Benna, so we call him Kwa, and a female associated with the female force, Abena, Sekhmet, title of Sekhmet, Sechima, that she will be called Abena when she's born on that day. Oh, she was assigned to the Abosom. This proves that she was assigned to the Abosom, Abena, Sechima, Sekhmet, pre-incarnation by Inyame Wa Inyame, and this is why she came out on this day, so her soul's name is Abena. So the same is true for all seven days of the week. We are named after the Abosom because our souls are governed by the energy of these Abosom. But they also operate through the solar, lunar, and planetary body. They operate across the board. 
They have shrines within the planets. They have shrines within the stars. They have shrines with the sun, within the sun, moon. And even when you get on the planets, on the planet Earth, for example, they have shrines within the Earth. There are deities that animate the ocean, deities that animate the Earth Mother, deities that animate the atmosphere, fire, mountains, winds, thunder, lightning, and so forth. They all have their regions, areas, and so forth in the planet Earth. They also have their organs and organ systems within our physical body. They also have the corresponding spiritual organs and organ systems within our spiritual anatomy. They also have um, their regions within the planet, the different aspects of the planet, the core and the photosphere of the sun, for example, or the core and the um, surface of the various planets and the magnetosphere of these different planets are governed by these various arbosomes. The same thing with the moon, same thing with the sun. The sun has a core, the sun has a photosphere, the sun has a corona and so forth. These different aspects of this orb are governed by different divinities. And then, of course, the stars as well. So on every level of creation, these various divinities operate through the stellar realm, solar realm, lunar realm, earthly realm, inside your physical body, inside your spirit, the divisions of your spirit. On every level, they have shrines. They have karu, centers of resonance that they can take up residence in and communicate with us through. So this seven-day week, however, is a natural cycle. Just like we understand, of course, that the sun, the oria, as we call it in our con, affects the planet. The heat of the sun affects the planet, affects the seasons, and so forth. We understand that. The change of the seasons, the uh, daily solar cycle and everything, we understand it, it's direct effects because it's so powerful. If you look at the moon, it's not as powerful as the sun, obviously, but it has a direct effect. The gravity of the moon, the gravitational pull of the moon, affects the rising and lowering of the tides on the planet Earth, and therefore the rising and lowering of the tides of the water levels within your body. When you have higher water levels, you become more watery, and that affects your emotions. And if you become more dried out, your water levels decrease, your tides decrease, become more dried out, that affects the way you, your energetic output, your emotional output, and so forth. Just like the moon affects the earth, the moon affects the inhabitants of the earth who are connected with this spirit, the spiritual force that animates the moon. So we understand that with the sun and the moon. But the same is true of the various ochin and soroma, the planets, as we call them in our common tradition, as well, that go through that seven-day cycle. The manifestation of these different planets, they show up at the first hour of sunrise and they govern that particular day just by virtue of the fact, for example, that you can see the planet Vidna, the red planet, that they call Heru Desher, the red Heru in ancient Kemet, the red fiery planet of war and so forth, just by virtue of the fact that you can look up in the sky and see that planet and its reddish tint. If you can see that, that means the energy is reaching you and you are connecting with that energy, so it's having an effect upon you. And the energy of the Abosom can travel through that beam of energy to connect with you, just like the energy itself touches you physiologically, the spiritual force that animates that planet can operate through that bridge of energy to touch you spiritually, to touch your spirit body as well and affect you, and they do affect them. The movements of the planets affect the earth itself. All of the planets, of course, are within the orbit of the area of the sun, they're within the field of the sun, and they affect one another. The magnetosphere of Earth affects the magnetosphere of the other planets. And they're all affected by the magnetosphere of the sun as well. And stay in the sun, the orias, the sun's orbit. So they affect us physiologically, but they also the spirits that animate the sun, moon, and seven and various planets, um, eight planets and so forth, including Earth, um, affects us spiritually. The abosome that animates them affects our spirit body. It's like your physical body is dependent on the sun. If without the sun, your physical body would deteriorate, of course. Your spirit body is replenished by the abosome, the forces of nature that animate the sun. And the same is true of the spirit forces, the abosome that animates the moon and the other planets that move in that seven-day cycle. The Akan culture is rooted in that seven-day cycle, governed by that seven-day cycle, 
various abosom have different have akradim as well soul names as well based on that seven day cycle. Our entire calendar is based on um, six um, sets of seven days and so forth. Um, the 42 day Adadria nine cycle, which goes across the ritual calendar across the year and so forth. We name our children, the names of trees and animals and plant life and mineral life and so forth are named after the energy complexes that govern this seven-day cycle. Everything in our common culture is regulated by this seven-day cycle because of the, the knowledge we have of the abosom that animate these solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that affect us spiritually as well as physiologically. If we go even further, just dealing with chronobiology, you have the so-called field of chronobiology, and in that field you have circadian rhythm. One of those rhythms is the circa septin cycle, which means about seven days, and every seven days there's, there are biological functions that take place. There are biological functions that are replenished. There are a number of different things with regard to heart rate and, and even urine and, and other organs transplants and how they are affected every seven days, the seventh day, 14th day, 21st day, and so forth because of the cycle, seven-day cycle that our body goes through. That directly impacts every aspect of our lives on an individual level, just like the movement of these planets around the sun and their effect upon all natural cycles on Earth comprise that seven-day cycle. So we have always dealt with this cycle. The White and Offspring, learning about the circa septin cycle, dealing with chronobiology, it's, that's new to them. But our Khan people have regulated our lives based on this ancient seven-day cycle and the deities that govern them. That is, includes the kara, kara, the different chakras. So let us get into that. When you look on this particular page, you will see that we have um, articles on every one of the divinities that govern the sun, moon, and the planetary bodies and so forth. When you look at the image that we use for the promo of the show, we show the planetary bodies and the sun and the moon and so forth in, um, in a specific um, arrangement. We arrange them based on the abosome that governs the planet and, you know, of course, the seven knots, the kasa on the spine, kasa. So if you look, for example, Akwesida or Awusida, which is Sunday, governed by the Oriya, the sun. Um, you have Joada, which is Monday, governed by the Osurane, the moon. Benada or Abenada, which is Tuesday, governed by the planet Bena or Abena, which is so-called Mars. Awukuda or Akuada, Wednesday, governed by the Oche, in Soroma. Awuku or Aku, which is the planet Mercury. Um, you have Yauda, which is Thursday. Also called Yada and Abada, the Ochi and Soroma, the planet Yao, which is Jupiter, the white and offspring called Yao Pater or Pater Yao, Father Yao, is Yao, Yabosom Yao. Also the female Abosom Ya and Abba, which is Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune. Then Fida, Ochi, and Soroma, Afi, or the planet Afi, which is so called Venus, and then Miminida. Aminni or Amimin, the planet Amimin, which is the planet, so-called planet Saturn. Now, so these, these are the names of the planets in the Akan tradition, but the Abosom that govern these bodies. On Sunday with the sun, when you have, you have Osar, Awusi, Osar or Uisi, um, as well as Oset, she's also called Esi, when they operate in connection with Ra and Ra'et, so in ancient Kemet, for example, you will see um, there's a text in ancient Kemet talking about when Ra and Asar meet at Jed Jedu and they combine their energy, and then you see the divinity Asar Ra or Ra Asar, um, a mummified figure. The top, the head of the figure, is um, a ram, flat horned ram, that is Ra. The body of the figure is mummified, that is Osar, Osar and Ra operating through the same body. No different than your pituitary gland and your bloodstream with the energy in the bloodstream working together to, to create hormones and everything else. 
It's like the brain and the spinal column. It's like the heart and the lung complex. The different organs are working together. When Ra and Asar work together, Asar is in connection with Ra. He's got Osara or Usala. Of course, that's Oshala in, in Yoruba, or Rishanla, which is a form of Avatala and so forth in Yoruba. But he's connected with the planet or connected with the sun as Osar, Ra, Awusi, Awisi, the Abosom of Sunday. Male. And then when our set is operating through the planet or operating through the sun in connection with Raya, she's called our set Raya or Raya Seek. Our set Raya, she's in connection with the sun. When they are not in connection with Ra and Raya and not operating through the Aten, the sun, and they're operating through the moon, they are called in our Khan culture Ajo and Ajua. Ajua being our set, Ajo being our self. But when they're in connection with Ra and Raet, they're called Awusi and Esu. So, and it's no different than when you see the sun shining directly on earth, you feel the energy of the sun directly. When the sun sets and the moon rises and you see a full moon and you have moonlight hitting the earth, it's not just the energy of the moon hitting earth. It's the sunlight that illuminates the moon. It's filtered through the moon, and then it hits Earth. So that energy of the sunlight is conditioned by the, by the moon. No different than if you have a uh, stained glass window. If the sunlight is shining through a, a clear window, then it comes directly out the white, yellowish white light of the sun. If you made the window a stained glass with green and so forth, the exact same sunlight shines through the window, but then it comes out of the other side of the window as green because it's been conditioned through the medium it passes. The same is true with the moon. So when the energy of the sun combines with the moon, the moon is still projecting its energy, its gravitational pull affects the earth and so forth, but the sunlight is conditioned through the moon, so you have that moonlight. That's the union of the solar and the lunar energy fused together. That's the same as Osar operating in connection with Ra, Therefore, he's called Awusi or Awisi on Sunday. But when he's operating with that connection to Ra, he's Ajo operating through the moon. And then Aset is Ajoa operating through the moon or Monday. So that's key. Um, the planet Benna, you'll find Abena and Benna, which is Heru, Behudet, and Sechima, Sekhmet, as we said earlier. Awuku and Akua, which is Set and Nebethet operating through the planet Mercury, so called Mercury, which is Awuku. Um, Yao, Ya, and Abba, which is Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune. This is Peru, the son of our star and our set. Then you have Wachet and Nekebet. In Yoruba, of course, that is Shango. Then you have Oya, and then you have um, Oba, the first wife of Shango. Shango, Oya, and Oba. And Akan is Yao, Ya, and Abba. In Vodun, it is Hevioso, or simply So, also called Hevioso, um, um, Evejida, and then Ayaba. Um, and, for, and, and also, the planet Bena, Mars, um, which is Abena, Bena and Abena, Ruba Hudet, and Sechima, that is Ogun and Iyami Abeni in the Yoruba tradition. Of course, Aku, Kweku Anansi, and Akua, is set and never heading to met. It is Eshu and the wife of Eshu, who is called Agberu, the load bearer um, in the Yoruba tradition. Eshu and Agberu, set and never heading to met. Awuku and Akua in Akan. So we want to mention that. And then, of course, Yao, Ya, and Aba for Thursday. Shango, Oya, Oba in Yoruba. Um, Hebioso, uh, Abejida, and Ayaba in Vodun. Yao Yana Banaka. Heru, son of Osar and Aset, Wachet, and Nekebet in ancient command. The planet Afi, so called operating through the planet Afi or Venus, is Het Heru in ancient command. She's also called Cheche in Akan. Of course, Cheche comes directly from Het He in ancient command. Um, of course, she is called Oshun in the Yoruba tradition, Azili in Vodun. And Miminida, the day of Miminida is the planet Amin Min, which is so called Saturn. Um, 
this is the planet and, and the divinity men or Amen Men and as you can met, he's Amen Men in Akan. He is um Orisha Oko in Yoruba tradition, he's Azaka in Vodun. These are the divinities that operate through these solar, lunar, and planetary bodies. These solar, lunar, and planetary bodies of the seven days can be arranged according to the seven knots on the spine, the seven kasa, the seven knots along the spine. The cyclical manifestation of energy that occurs in the so-called circa septin cycle about seven days, every seven days, but more importantly than that chronobiological cycle that the whites in our spring have recently rediscovered or learned about through studying our texts and so forth, this same cycle that the Akan people have regulated their lives by for thousands of years, including the names of their babies, names of people, names of divinities, names of plant life, names of animal life, animal totem, mineral life, everything governs that cycle as, as well as the ritual calendar. Um, of course, they're connected to these energy centers within our body. Now, when you think about the kara, kara, the so-called chakra, remember we said anything round, cylinder, and also said the boulders and so forth in ancient Kemet, but anything round or a cylinder, kara also meaning shrine in ancient Kemet. Then we come to the Akan language, koro, koroa, meaning anything round or globular or spherical or circular, also meaning a calabash, a vessel an earthen vessel, a calabash, a gourd, and so forth. Those calabashes are used to hold um, precious material. These are shrines. And then kuru, kurua, kuruo also means a shrine for specifically for divinity. So you will see a kuruo called a pot or a shrine, a vessel at a shrine, and you say, well, what is inside of that vessel that is the offerings for the divinity? We'll have a kuruo, for example, which is a shrine for the crop, the soul, divine consciousness. That we utilize the water in that shrine to wash our crop, akra water. So you have that little vessel on your shrine to cleanse your head. Utilize that ritual water that has been purified and electrified through ritual prayer and so forth. You utilize that water just like you use water to pull the physical debris off your head and cleanse your head. Use that electrified water full of tumi, full of the power of the abosom to pull the negative energy, um, its um, corded vibration, perverse energy off of your spiritual head as well so you can be more clear and repel negative projections and so forth. So you'll see a kudua on the shrines of Akan people, which is simply a very, any manner of vessel. Um, this is what the kara or kudua, the kara kara are. They're a shrine. We talked about the notion of magnification in the past. The shrine is a magnifier of energy, which is key. We talked about how you can, you can have the sun shining, beaming down on some, some leaves, some dry leaves on the ground, but if you take a magnifying glass and put it between the sunlight and the leaves and position it properly, all of a sudden the leaves will combust because the magnifying glass has magnified the energy of the sunlight, and that combustion takes place and the leaves catch on fire. The energy of the abosom, like the energy of the sun coming into the shrine room and so forth. And when you establish a shrine, the shrine itself becomes a magnifier of the energy of a specific abosom, and their energy becomes very powerful and intense at your shrine. And therefore, they take up residence once that shrine is intensified in that ritual fashion, and you can communicate directly with them. You've given them a physical seat to take up residence in as an abosom, as a spirit. Now you have a full spiritual and physical communication with these abosom. This is what shrines do, whether they are shrines for abosom divinities, shrines for the insamam, for the ancestors of the ancestors. Just like you set up or erect these shrines or altars in your home or, or shrine houses and so forth, the kara, kara, the, each one of the seven kara, kara, or kruo, kruo, are shrines, gore, vessels that carry the energy of these abosom of the seven days of the week. And they're aligned in a cyclical fashion. They manifest their energy in a cyclical manner. And because the Akan people have maintained the seven-day week and named ourselves after these seven abosom and so forth, we actually have the energy and the proper alignment of these seven um, 
enshrined spaces. Remember, as we mentioned earlier, when they talk about hierarchies of chakras, it's only in the 8th century of this era that the white snarl screen began to speculate on hierarchies of chakras. So even though the term kara, kakra, is simply meaning will, can be found in the Vedas going back to 1700 BCE, it has nothing to do with energy centers in the body back then. It's just talking about a will, like the will of a chariot, or people sitting around in a circle. It just means circle or will. Thousands of years later, they begin to associate it with energy centers in the body because they find that in ancient Kemet. And they found that in our text in ancient Kemet. And in fact, before we even go forward with that, let me just read one of those texts right quick from the pyramid text, the oldest religious text in existence on earth today. And we put this in our text. There's a grouping of cobra divinities that are seven in number. These seven aratu, called the seven urei, are key to the notion of the kar, 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 kara, and kata, the shrines and knots and so forth. And then we give an excerpt from the mer or the pyramid of Unasam, page 26 of our book, on the origin of the term yoga. This is the pyramid text of the Pera, so-called Pharaoh Unas, scribed over 4,400 years ago. Quote, and this is utterance number 318. Unas, which is the king, is the now snake, the leading bull, who has swallowed his seven aratu, meaning the seven urei cobras, and so his seven neck vertebrae came into being who give orders to his seven postjatu, Ineid, so to speak, to hear the words of the king. So you, Unas, as a snake, he swallows the seven Urei cobra, and they take up residence inside of him as his seven neck vertebrae, seven radiant discs, who take up residence within the king as his seven neck vertebrae. This, this is the origin of this whole doctrine of the vertebrae being associated with the radiant energy of the serpent, cobras, and so forth inside the body. It has nothing to do with the white snare offspring and India. Now, as we said earlier, the white snare offspring don't begin to start talking about hierarch hierarchies of chakra until the 8th century of this era. And then later on after that, they began to start associating very recently the colors of the rainbow with the different chakras, and they began to speculate. So all these various books talking about the colors of the chakras and what they mean and so forth is recent speculation by the white and their offspring. It's not based on reality. They've looked at various texts and tried to piece things together, and then they manufacture things. So therefore, they start putting forth pseudo-philosophy and colors and so forth not having any real understanding of who these divinities are. But we actually have the, the divinities because we name ourselves after them. And our entire culture revolves around the, the seven-day week and the abosom of the seven-day week. So let's go through that list real quick so we can see that. So if you look at the actual promo for the show and you look at the, the image, and we have the image of the planets and so forth, you see at the top, you see the planet Saturn. Why do we have the planet Saturn in the crown region? The planet Saturn is called Amini in our kind, and Amin Mini, which is Amin Men, the divinity Amin Men. You see Amin Men, or the divinity Men. He is called the most ancient one, defender of the past, regulator of ancestral protocol, constantly inseminating or in, involved in inseminating creation is typically shown as phallic, meaning having an erect phallus constantly inseminating, engaged in the creation of the world. And you have the union of Amin Min and Het Heru, she's called Min Minit in that regard. She, he is the great bull, Heru Kapet, and she is the great cow, the great kayak. The term for Kai and Kai is soul male and female, but then the term for bull and cow is also ka and kayak. 
and the term for phallus and vagina is also ka, phallus and kaya, vagina. You'll find kote and akan meaning phallus as well. So he is shown sometimes as a great bull, the great bull of men, or I'm in men, but then he's also shown as the great mummified one, um, mummified in white bandages, it's a phallic constantly inseminating the great cow, inseminating het heru and so forth, constantly creating. He is the most ancient one, defender of the past. He has two um, plumes as amen men, two feathers um, going up from the top of his head, two tall feathers reaching up into the sky, sometimes different colors. These two feathers, sitting in between those two feathers is the radiant disc of the sun. So you have these two feathers with these different colors and the radiant disc of the sun. This is the thousand petal or thousand petal lotus, so to speak, the radiant energy at the crown of the head. Remember, Amen Men is the most ancient one, the ancient divinity, defender protocol and so forth, same in, in our Khan culture. But Amen Minni in our Khan also means brain, talking about the head, talking about the crown. And when you look at the crown of Amen Men in ancient Kemet, you'll see that his crown with that red ribbon going from the back of the crown, dropping all the way to the ground, is the central nervous system. The brain and the spinal column is the crown of Amen Men because he's the crown, quote unquote, kara, kara. And this is why we have Saturn with the ring, the crown at the top because the divinity that animates that planet that Ochin Unsoroma is Amen Men, the most ancient one. He's mummified because he's purified and he's impervious to decay. He's mummified in white bandages, and this is why in Yoruba tradition, he's called one of the um, Orisha Fun Fun, one of the white Orisha, meaning ritually purified, not skin color, of course. Um, just like Osar is also ritually purified and mummified in bandages. Obatala is one of the white or Orisha Fun Fun, the white Orisha, talking about ritual colors. So it's Orisha Oko, one of the Orisha Fun Fun, the white Orisha, and this is why sacred colors in ancient Kemet for Amen Men is white, um, because he's mummified there. And, of course, he's wearing the sun disk of Amen Men. That whole symbolism comes directly from him. This is where you get that thousand foot of lotus, lotus and so forth. That comes much later. It's just a um, copy of who he is and what his functioning creation is. And we have an um, article dealing with him in detail. Then you go down to the next one, and we have the sun and the second position, where the so-called um, third eye chakra is. Now, why do you have the sun there, and then you have awusi, the abosom awusi, the abosom asa? And recall that these seven solar, lunar, and planetary bodies, remember there are various divinities that operate through the different planetary bodies, just like there are various divinities that operate through the planet Earth. The core of the Earth, the inner core, the inner inner core, the outer core, the upper and lower mantle, the upper and lower crust, the black soil, red soil, river water, ocean, um, atmosphere, thunder, lightning, and so forth, these various divinities manifest in these different aspects of the planet. There are also different aspects of the sun, like the core and the photosphere and everything else, different aspects of these, um, the different planetary bodies as well. So the different divinities have their regions in the different planets, just like they have their regions in your different bodies. But then you also have certain divinities ha who have a regulatory function over other divinities, just like Osar has a regulatory function in creation. Aset has a regulatory function in creation. Just like your pituitary gland has a regulatory function in the body. It regulates the functions of other glands. The pineal gland has a regulatory function in the body. It regulates the functions of other glands through hormonal secretion. The appendix is not, doesn't have a regulatory function. It receives directions and it, it executes its function, but it doesn't regulate the functions of other glands. Some glands are regulatory in nature, like supervisors or managers, and some are more so workers. And the same is true of certain divinities. The mother and father divinities and grandmother and grandfather divinities are regulated because they are literally the organs within the great divine body of the supreme being. So you have divinities who regulate the functions of the different divinities 
in a planetary body. So this is why you have certain divinities that are major divinities that animate the different solar, lunar, and planetary bodies. Again, when Asar is operating in harmony with Ra, you've got Awusi, you have both some of the of major Abosom animating and regulating energy within the sun in this regard when he's in connection with Ra. So you'll see that the second planetary power, which is the solar power, is in the eye region in this particular arrangement. Why would that be so? Why is Asar connected with the eye, the so-called third eye? First of all, you look at his name. Of course, you look at his function. He operates with the pituitary gland, which is the master gland in the body. The pineal gland is services, in reality, the pituitary gland. The pineal gland and the pituitary is the same as the king and the ochiame in the Akan tradition. The spokesperson of the king is the same as the king sitting on the throne and um, to who he's standing next to him as the spokesperson. The pineal gland is the light-sensitive gland. It receives the light, is stimulated, and then secretes hormones and so forth. Um, you see the spokesperson standing next to the king. You speak to the spokesperson, the Ochiame, as we call him in Akan, and Okime, as they're called in ancient Kemet. You speak to the spokesperson, then he speaks to the king or queen mother. They speak to him, and then he speaks to the people. That same arrangement we have in the court structure of Akan culture, same in ancient Kemet. Same within your body, the pineal gland is that spokesperson or advisor to the king or the queen mother. But the, the master gland is the pituitary gland that is uh, the seat of Awusi. Of course, Aset and Awusi, Asar and Aset govern that area, and they also govern at the top. And then we're going to get to the region near the vagina structure and uterus structure with Aset down there as well. Um, so they're at both ends, top and bottom. Um, so you have Awusi in that eye region. When you look at his name, of course, so that's his physical seat within the body. The pituitary gland crystallizes his energy in that region, the regulate, regulatory function in the body. When you look at his name, of course, Asar, first you see the seat of authority, As Asi, and then the second part of his name is Ai or Eni, which is the eye. So you have the seat the throne, and then you have the eye. Why is the eye there? Because it is that eye that's right in the middle, that first eye, that regulatory eye. That's the reason why the sun is there. This is why Awusi or Asar, Ra, is connected with the sun in that regard. And of course, Aset, Ra'at, is connected with the sun as well. So this is why we have the crown chakra, Amen Men, the great defender, great elder, great ancestor, one who's constantly inseminating creation nonstop, and this is why creation keeps going, um, the most ancient one and so forth, and his crown is the brain and uh, central nervous system. The brain and spinal cord, and then the feathers are shooting up into the sky with the different colors and, the, you know, the radiant disc in the middle. That is the crown chakra. Then the second piece is the eye itself, and we're dealing with the sun, Awusi, um, at that eye region. Of course, it's the text of ancient Kemet. We'll talk about the right eye of Ra is the sun. The left eye of Ra is the moon. And, of course, when Asar operates in connection with Ra, he operates with the sun. When he, outside of that connection with Ra, he operates with the moon as Ajo. And then, of course, Aset operates as Ajua as well. We're going to get into that. So. Then the next shrine, the next kara, kara, where the throat is, and then you will have the divinity Awuku, the so-called planet Awuku or so-called Mercury, the communica communicator. There's a difference between the messenger, the essain, the communicator, and the spokesperson. The spokesperson is Tehuti as well as Sesha. They're standing right next to the king and queen mother with their staff. And the king and queen mother speak directly into the ears of the male and female spokespersons of divine wisdom, and they enunciate the desires of the king and queen mother for the entire um, court structure and people who are in the palace and so forth to hear. They proclaim the desires of the king and queen mother, what direction the nation will be going in, to everybody in the court structure. 
once that proclamation is made through the mouthpiece, then the essane, who is the messenger, the herald, takes that proclamation and runs all throughout the kingdom, queendom, the nation, spreading that information. The messenger is the worker of the spokesperson. The spokesperson remains in court in close proximity to the king and queen mother. But the messenger takes the proclamation and delivers it throughout the nation. The messenger is Awuku. The messenger is Kweku Anansi. He's the one who carries the message. He operates through the nervous system. He takes the message that's enunciated and formed within the brain and carries it throughout the world wide web of the body, all throughout the body. He leaves the brain or the court structure and carries it throughout the body. Um, this is why, of course, Kweku Anansi in our con culture is shown as a spider. Anansi is a spider. The world wide web in the body is the nervous system, the peripheral nervous system. The world wide web in creation is a divinely woven, intricate web of energy that's woven by Anansi Kokroko, the great spider. And once he weaves that web of energy, he can travel along the roads of that web. He is the messenger, the communicator, also the divine trickster, and so forth. Eshu, he is Legba, and, and so forth in, in Yoruba and Vodun, the messenger. So, um, so this is why in the throat region, you have Awuku, the planet Awuku, Kweku Anansi, the messenger that speaks. And you also, of course, um, on the female side, you have Akua, which is Nebit Het, where she's also the courierette. She has a bowl on her head. She's the load bearer. She carries the offerings of the Abosom, the offerings of the divinity for ritual practice and so forth. Awuku Akweku Anansi carries the message from us to the divinities and the ancestral spirits and their messages to us. Nebit Het, with a bowl on her head, is the courierette. And she carries the offerings, the sacrificial offerings that we make to the Abosom. She carries those to us. Kwekwanansi carries the message. She carries the energy. Um, before we go forward, we just want to say um, there is a little bit over a minute left in the broadcast as far as online. So if you want to listen beyond 11 o'clock, um, you must call in within the next minute or else because it's going to cut off online and only the people on the phone will be able to listen. So uh, the phone number is 657 You have a little bit less than 45 seconds to call in, and only the people who are on the phone line after 11 o'clock will be able to hear. 657-383-0635. Um, and we're not going to go too much longer beyond 11, but we do. We just want to finish up these sets. So, so that throat region, throat chakra, kara or kasa, that shrine for the abosom. Um, and also, just just to even give a further point, um, clarification point on the nature of these seven shrines within the body. Um, we already talked about them as magnifiers of energy, and they carry the energy of the abosom. And when they are, when you're in alignment with your forces in nature, they can act as relay stations of centers of resonance for the abosom. As long as you're in, operating in harmony with order, then the abosom can communicate with you through these shrines. No different than if you had seven cell phones, and they were all turned on, and they all had their batteries charged up and everything. Um, you have seven entities. Now, if you have the proper numbers, if somebody has the proper number and they can call, then your seven cell phones will ring and you can pick up the phone, those phones and utilize that entity, that little shrine to communicate, that center of resonance, to communicate with somebody who's thousands of miles away from you somewhere, somebody on the other side of the planet. If you don't have their number, if they don't have your number, then it doesn't matter that the phone is on and it's plugged in, and even if you pick up the phone and pop, it has some energy in it. It doesn't matter because if they don't have the right connection or if there is no signal, then you just have a phone that has some electric, electromagnetic energy moving through it, but it has no connection to anybody else. It's 
especially if it doesn't have a sick. That's the same as somebody having a kara kara little shrines inside of their body, meaning the whites in their offspring. They have centers of electromagnetic energy around their nerve ganglia, the various plexi, the plexus, so to speak, in the body, but their shrines are empty because they don't have the number or the signal to connect with the abosome who would normally be connected to these shrines. So they cannot communicate with them, and the abosome does not communicate with them through their nerve ganglia, through their knot. So the only spirits that they can communicate with through their empty shrines are their corrupt, perverted, disordered, deceased relatives and non-relatives. Our people, however, we have shrines, we have a signal, our phones are on, we have a direct line to the abosome, and once we align with them ritually, ritual song, ritual dance, ritual prayer, ritual kabomu and so forth, um, susu home meditation and so forth, the different forms of ritual that we engage in, um, we clear those shrines up, then we can communicate directly with them. All right. So let's get through the, the next few. We talked about the first three. Get into that um, throat chakra, kara, kara, that throat kasa, that throat knot, and so forth, that awuku, kwekwenansi, and so forth, um, as well as akua connected there as well. Um, the next one, we're dealing with the heart, kara, kara. And what you have here is the heart and lung complex, and they work together. So when you read the article about Yao, which is Heru, son of Asar Naset, as well as Ya and Abba, all three articles, which is Heru, Wachet, and Nekabet. Yao, Ya, and Abba. Shango, Oya, and Abba. Um, Hevioso, Abedida, and Ayaba. You read those three articles, you're dealing with Heru. His planetary home is the planet Jupiter. It is the largest planet in the system. It is the heaviest planet, so to speak, or the largest in the system. It is sitting right in the middle. It's the king of the planet. So the planetary home with regard to all of the other planets for Heru, the son of Alsar, who becomes king in the place of Alsar in the world, the planetary home is Yao so-called Jupiter. But Heru, as a force in nature, operates through the core of things, the core of the sun, the core of the earth, the core of the various planets. But then when you look at the solar system as a system, the planetary core with regard to the other planets, the biggest planet, the heavy planet, and so forth, is the Heru planet, the Yao planet, the Jupiter planet. So that is the core, the heavy one. So he sits right in the middle. That is his planetary home, but he also, again, operates at the core of the sun, the core of Earth, and so forth. So this is why in our Khan culture, Yauda, or Thursday, is connected to the planet Ya, and he's connected to the chest and the heart and cardiovascular system. And when you're called Akoko Duru, Akoko Duru, meaning the chest, Akoko Duru is heavy. That's one who has heart, that one who is brave, the one who has courage and so forth, and it is the uh, it is a praise name or Mrane of Ya, of Shango, of Heru, the one who fights relentlessly, challenges disorder to maintain the, the order in the nation. He is the one that holds the nation together after Set overtakes the nation and causes, you know, um, disorder and so forth with this tyrannical rule. Heru challenges that disorder, repels him from rulership, takes up the mantle of rulership, and rules and sits in the middle and regulates order within the system, within the nation, just like your heart regulates the flow of blood to all cells within the body. When the cells need, you know, um, and the parts of the body need more blood because it's time to fight or fly, fight or flight and so forth, then the heart begins to pump faster to send more blood, which carries more electromagnetic energy, which carries more power and so forth. So he regulates the flow of energy. The heart is relentless, relentlessly pumping, relentlessly moving, relentlessly um, sending out energy. And when it's time to fight, relentlessly sending out that firepower to challenge that disorder until the disorder is eliminated. So this is what the king does. So Heru is sitting right in the midst. 
But then on both sides of the king, you have the two royal protectresses of royal sovereignty, the two queens, um, Wachet and Nekebet, the two, the bronchial tubes, the trees, the plants, the, the, you know, the plant of the north and the plant of the south that are connected to, with Wachet and Nekebet, the lotus and the lily and so forth. You have Wachet and Nekebet. Those plants are in the Smai Tawi symbol, which is right inside of the lungs, the bronchial tree within the lungs, those two plants of the north and south. And then you have, of course, Wachet of the north, Nekebet of the south. They're governing the winds and so forth, the winds inside the lungs or the bronchial tubes inside the lungs. They govern the wind. Well, Yah governs the wind. You have the magnetosphere of Earth with the north and south pole regulating that, which, of course, affects the wind. That is Wachet and Nekebet, the electromagnetic energy of the magnetosphere manifests through the wind, manifests through the winds in the body, which is the lungs, bronchial tubes, all of that. And they're sitting right next to, um, on both sides of the king, and the king is sitting in the middle. So this is why, of course, every king, whether it's the female um, ruler or the queen mother, the sovereign, they have the title, the Nefti title, meaning they're children of Wachet and Nekabet, the quote-unquote two ladies and so forth, the Nefti, the two mistresses of the north and south of the two lands. Um, so you have Uranus and Neptune, those two twin gas planets, the greenish color of the planet Uranus is also the greenish color of Wachet. In fact, Watch in ancient Kemet means green. Wachet is the green one, talking about the lily planet in the north and so forth. And then you have Nekabet connected to the blue energy. Of course, the planet um, Nekabet or Neptune has that bluish energy. It also has a little eye in it, just like the planet Jupiter and so forth. Um, so that the twin planets of the blue and the greenish, greenish planets are connected with uh, is Wachet and Nekabet with their sacred colors. They're on both sides of the king, juxtaposed to the king or the sovereign, the ruler, whether it's the king or the queen mother. Um, of course, you see the green and blue energy of these serpents. And sometimes you see Wachet and Nekabet as the serpent and the vulture. Sometimes you see them as two serpents, winged serpents. So that serpentine energy with wings is dealing with the electromagnetic energy, the serpentine energy, but with wings, talking about carried within the magnetosphere or the wind or the law, um, animated by the law. And you also see these two green and blue serpents. Um, you can see it right through your skin um, with the, you know, the greenish, bluish energy colors of the veins moving through your body, carrying that energy um, within the body. So there you have that center, that heart center, is dealing with waging war against the enemy. Courage, bravery, the power of the heart, relentlessly challenging disorder. It's not about forgiveness. It's not about unconditional love, which there's no such thing. There's no basis in reality for that at all. When you're talking about Heru, Wachet, and Nekabet, Wachet wages war and destroys the enemy. That centripetal force, the centrifugal force, rather, waging war, obliterating the enemy. She's wearing that red crown. And then you have Nekabet with that centripetal force, that inward magnetic force destroying the enemy through consumption, where Wachet is destroying the enemy with that centrifugal force through obliteration, through destruction. They're following the sovereign into war. At the, on the forehead of the sovereign, the fire spitting cobras and so forth, destroying the enemy. And they're right at the heart region. Flanking the heart is the lung complex. The heart and lung complex works together, and you have Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune, or Yao, Ya, and Abba, and so forth. All that's connected to the heart. So all of this misinformation about unconditional love that has no basis in reality, of course, in our book of Modern and Chi, Divine Law, Love and Divine Hate, we show that love and law is the same word. Literally, in ancient Kemet, meh, meh means love, and meh means law in ancient Kemet. The male and female forces of law are ma'a and ma'at. If the female force is ma'at, the male force is ma'at. These are dead that we invoke. So when you're talking about law, you're talking about love in the true concept. We're not falling in and out of love. We're not falling in and out of ma'at and ma'at, falling in and out of a dead 
we invoke Ma'a and Ma'at for balance. Now, law is the expression of order. Law shows the rules, the expression of what is to be ordered, the specific manner in which the order is uh, made manifest or expressed. There's no such thing as unconditional law. Law is the basis of that which is conditional. When you talk about divine order, that means order. Something, something is placed in a certain way, done in a certain way, arranged in a certain way. That's what order is. It's conditioned. That's the nature of order, conditioning. If you have an order, then you also have disorder, meaning things are out of order. They're not part of the way things have been conditioned or structured or arranged. They have circumvented that order. So when you talk about love or law, it is the expression of order. It expresses the conditions placed on creation by the supreme being. So how in the world can there be something called unconditional love or unconditional law when law is the basis of conditioning in the created order? That's insane. That's the whites and their offspring trying to put forth this notion that we should accept all and reject none because they are parasites. Cancerous cells would like to go on a campaign and tell all the healthy cells, hey, you should accept all and reject none so that they can go through the body consuming and killing every cell in the body until they destroy the entire body. But the immune system knows better, so it kills the cancerous cells. It doesn't accept their campaign for accepting them. It kills them to keep the body moving in a harmonious fashion. There's no such thing as unconditional love because there's no such thing as unconditional law because law is the basis of that which is conditioned. So when you're dealing with the heart, you're dealing with that relentless challenging of disorder. The king or the queen mother, the sovereign, can sit right in the midst of the, the nation, just like the spokes inside of a wheel has the power to hold the wheel together. The sovereign has the power to hold the country together because they are invested with that power to hold everything together and relentlessly challenge disorder. They have that kind of power or they have that kind of weight because they can destroy disorder when it manifests and cut off its activity. This is what we're dealing with, what the heart is dealing with. Um, next piece is the, you see the planet Benna and Abenna, which is the seat of the quote unquote solar plexus, um, so called Ogun Iami Aben, and operating through that particular planet, Benna and Abenna, enforcer of divine order connected to the immune system within the body, the lymphatic system in the body. Arubakudet and Sechima, Benna and Abenna are the immune and lymphatic systems in the body that destroy this order constantly for the maintenance of the order. Heru challenges this order. Wachet and Nekabet, they, anything that comes into the kingdom that seeks to create this order, they challenge it immediately, consistently, and relentlessly and push it back out and repair things that can be repaired, like some of our people who engage in this order were rebuffed and repelled by these forces in nature and forced into a position where we can make a change. But once you have certain cells that have gone beyond repair and there, there's no hope of reparation, then they move beyond what the functions of Heru, Behudet, and Wachet, and Nekabet as far as holding things together in creation, and they're slated for destruction. And here you have Heru, Behudet, and Sechima who come to destroy, to exterminate these corrupted cells. Just like we exterminate the cancerous cells within the great divine body of the Supreme Being. And until we exterminate the cancerous cells within the great divine body of the Supreme Being, they will seek to continue, continue to consume and destroy our people. Of course, the whites and their offspring are the cancerous cells within the body of the Supreme Being. They are disfigured cells that seek only to consume and destroy everything in their path until they are exterminated. That is the only solution. So when we deal with the immune system and lymphatic system in the body, there's also an immune system and lymphatic system in 
to the great divine body, and that is regulated and animated by Binna and Abina Erubehu Dead and Sechima. And the central center of resonance in our solar system for their energy, of course, is the planet Binna and Abina, so called bars, and inside your spirit body, that center of resonance, that specific um, set of nerve ganglia, um, that particular plexus is the solar plexus. So that's the center of resonance. Of course, they radiate through the immune system and lymphatic system, but that's the center of resonance within that set of seven nerve ganglia up and down the spine. Um, then the next, um, the next section, uh, you'll see the so-called sacral plexus, and of course that is connected to the abosome afi, which is Heru, um, but also you're dealing with, on the male side, you're dealing with Amen Men. And remember, Amen Men, one of the titles of Heru is Men Menik. In the Akan culture, she's called Afi. She's also called Amen Meniwa. Um, Amen Men, is, he's called Amen Men in Akan. He's also called Fi or Fai. And that comes from, on the male side, he's, he's, sometimes he's called Fi, sometimes he's called Amen Men. Heru is called Afi, but she's called Amemeniwa. So Fi and Afia is Amemen and Memeni in ancient Kemet. So-called men and Hathor, as they would say in ancient Kemet. Orisha Oko and Oshun Ibudioko. Oshun, the wife of Oko. That same marriage in Yoruba, the same marriage in Akan, Amemen and Amemeniwa, or Afi and Kofi or Fifi, um, the same in ancient Kemet as Amemen and Menmeni. These two divinities. Of course, Oshun is connected to the fallopian tubes in the female. She's connected to the epididymis in the male. Same structure. Um, dealing with sensual attraction, but also the replenishment of harmony, which is what we consider, quote unquote, pleasure and so forth. The sens um, sensory energy that is the precursor to sexual activity or procreative activity and the replenishment of its harmony. You have to have that magnetism that is the precursor to procreative activity to cause the union of the sperm and ovum to develop into the zygote so, so that life can come into the world. But even before that happens, you have to have the sensual um, or sensory activity of sensual um, attraction that is the precursor to procreate, create, procreative activity so that can take place. The same thing that happens in the physical body, the union of the sperm and ovum disparate elements that are different in character and quality and so forth, but they fuse together in a harmonious fashion to create life. She does the same thing with the union of um, different notes to create music, the union of different colors and shapes to create paintings, the union of different sounds, union of different um, structures and, and textures to create all different kinds of things, all the things that we see that are formed together in a harmonious fashion to make up plant life, animal life, mineral life, and afarakani, afarakani, human life, and the things that we innovate and create and give birth to and so forth, that's the dom domain of afi, as well as fi, fi, talking about pet heru, um, in her form as afi, or afia, operating to the planet afi, which is so-called Venus connected to the sacral um, plexus. And then we, so we show that, that energy there, show that planet there in that region. And, of course, the final uh, kara, kara, we're dealing with um, the moon, the osorane. And you'll see that, we sh of course, we show that image in the bottom. Of course, you can superimpose the afurakani or afurakani human body there. You're dealing with the root, um, kara, kara. Of course, the moon is receptive. It receives the energy of the sun and transmits that energy to Earth. It takes in all of that. Of course, there's an eclipse between the sun and the moon. And there's a fusion that takes place, all of that. So when you deal with, for example, on the female side, you have the birth canal in that region. You have the uh, vagina and uterus structure in that region. You have Ajua, um, Oduwa in Yoruba, Ajua. In Akan, which is offset, where she's not in connection with Raet, she's not operating through the sun, she's operating through the moon, 
and she is Ajua, the cool, receptive one. She's connected to the, you know, the birth canal and the uterus and so forth. In the male, you're dealing with the prostate region, um, spermatogenesis, embryogenesis, all these different things dealing with the uh, conception of the child. Also, there's a connection, of course, between the pituitary gland and the uterus. For example, the pituitary gland is sending out directives, secreting hormones, <clears throat> excuse me, but there's a feedback mechanism between uterine contractions and the release of oxytocin when somebody is, you know, um, in labor and everything else. So that connection between the uterus and the pituitary gland is the connection between offset and osara, ajua and ajo between the pituitary and the uterus, and of course there are two lobes, of, major lobes of the pituitary gland, which is, you know, offset and osara up there, and then down, that's at the top, and then at the bottom where the birth canal is, um, as well as the prostate, you have offset and osara, or ajua and ajo in those regions as well, dealing with conception, spermatogenesis, and everything else. So those different regions are... So those, so those are the seven different kata, kata or so-called kata karu, the seven shrines, the seven kasa, the seven knots along the spine and so forth, and the abosom still defined in detail in our Khan culture. So when you read through, we did a summary, but when you read through the documents for the different abosom of the seven days of the week on this page, we have a document on each one where we go into detail about their symbolism, the etymological origin of their names, showing, proving that they exist in ancient commit under the same names and descriptive titles, their planetary powers, their functioning creation, functioning the spirit body, and so forth, all those different things. Um, you get those details. Plus, we did a broadcast on 11 different, 11-part uh, series on each one of these, our both some. And we go into detail about those articles and some more detailed information. But as you look through uh, the different karu, number one, of course, we recognize from the outset, just when you study the book, terms and their functions are fully incorporated in ritual in ancient Kemet thousands of years before the whites and Arabs brain have any knowledge of them whatsoever. And they still exist in our common culture. So the seven-day week, is directly connected to these forces in nature. Um, so we had a couple of calls on the phone line before we sign off, and we also had some questions, I believe, in the chat room. So let's see. Okay, one of the questions: How can we live in harmony with the circumception cycle? So the circumception cycle is really the seven-day cycle that we're talking about. So that's, they're just renaming it the circumception cycle, but um, that's what we're talking about. But the key to aligning with that cycle and just any cycle, period, everything that you should be doing, how you're supposed to function in creation, how you're supposed to operate in creation is encoded specifically for you as an individual. You have a specific function a specific function related to your infra, I'm sorry, to your akra, your soul, your divine consciousness. Encoded within your spirit's brain, your cry, your soul, your divine consciousness is your infra and inkrabia, your specific function in creation, and the she and shebia, the specific configuration of energy you have been assigned by the supreme being, that energy is to be used to execute your function. That is encoded within you before you come into the world. And your ancestors and ancestors assist you in that process because they know what's encoded within you as well because they carry that energy as well. So aligning with your own kra at your shrine, as well as the shrine of your nananoman, samant, your spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors, but specifically aligning with your own kra ritually, that will allow you to align with your functioning creation, how to harmonize your thoughts, intentions, and actions with that divine function every moment of every day, and then when you make mistakes, how to realign yourself ritually so you can get back on track based on what clan you come from, and that's where the Usamapo comes from. Um, that's where they come in, where their functioning comes in. 
They can show you how to realign your thoughts, intentions, and actions ritually with order based on the specific clan you come from. The way we realign with order when we get off track is different than the way another Akurakani, Akurakani ethnic group realigns with divine order when they get off track based on their experiences over thousands of years and the foods they've incorporated into their system and the certain taboos that have developed based on their interactions with one another and other groups and plant life and animal life and mineral life and so forth. The Nanano and Samapo, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors can show you based on who you are specifically clan-wise on how to align your thoughts, intentions, and actions with order and to avoid social taboos, dietary taboos, ritual taboos that are associated with your clan that are different from other clans. Because if you do not align with your, and this is why that root chakra or root kara kara is important because the root, in fact, one of the terms, ajua in Akan is the name of the divinity, Aset, which is called uchua, which is, you know, the I, the ucha, the uchua, the way it's um, written in ancient commands, this is where we get Ajua from, talking about the moon, which is the left eye of Ra and so forth and Heru. Um, but Ajua and Ojo also means root. It means the divinity, Ajua, but it also means root. And that's why the moon, the Osorane, is also Ajo, the cool one, but it's also Ajo, the root. When you're rooted in your ancestry, knowing your specific clan that you come from and you learn that directly from your ancestors and ancestors, you also know what taboos are associated with your clan. Dietary, social, ritual, cultural, spiritual, and so forth. Because you can be engaged in all kinds of activities. Just think on a very lower, mundane level. A dietary taboo in Echiwadie, on the very lowest level outside of something spiritual, but the lowest level uh, a dietary taboo in English would be called an allergy, meaning if you eat a specific food, you will break out. But if you're a brother or a sister who came from the same mother, eat the same food, they have absolutely no problem. But for you, it's an allergy. So you have to recognize that and avoid that specific food. That's a restriction for you. That's a taboo. That's an etchiwakye. Just like we have dietary restriction. There are also spiritual restrictions. There are also social taboos, but also spiritual restrictions connected to the alboson that governs your head, connected to your clan. So if you're from a specific ancestral clan and you're ha having all kinds of problems, if someone eats a food that that's, makes them allergic and they don't realize that that's the thing that's making them break out and so forth, they're having all kinds of physical problems. And then they get on the Internet or they go to the doctors and so forth, and they say, well, when you're congested or when you have this or you have this, then you take this herb to take care of it. And they take this herb or they do this and do that and for years. They're taking all kinds of medications and all kinds of herbs and going through all kinds of things to overcome this, this sickness they have, only to find out finally one day they get a test to see what they're allergic to and a specific food that they've been eating for years is an allergen for them. And when they remove that food from their diet, they never have that problem again. So all that other stuff that they were doing was a waste of time. They need to deal with the allergen. What was the restriction that they were violating? The same thing happens ritually, spiritually. There are some activities that we should not engage in, engage in based on our clan affiliation because of the kind of interaction we've had with certain plant life, animal life, mineral life, and other Apurakani, Apurakani people, certain kinds of activities we should not engage in, certain kinds of offerings we should not engage in, certain kinds of sacrifices we should not engage in, certain kinds of behaviors we should not engage in. But if we don't know that and we engage in these things and we cause all kinds of spiritual problems in our lives, then we go to some diviner, we go to some spiritualist, we go to some therapists, we go to somebody else and they do all these rituals and tell, give us all this advice. And we do all kinds of cleansing and ritual practice and meditating and detoxing and the problem persists for years. And all that we were doing were violating the specific taboo that placed us out of harmony with order. But once we recognize through ritual practice 
aligning with our pra and our insamanfo, our specific direct blood ancestresses and ancestors who can show us what clan we're from and show us what these etiwadie or taboos are, then once we remove that and stop violating that etiwadie or taboo, the spiritual problems clear up instantaneously and permanently. All the other rituals were a waste of time because they were not addressing the fact that we may have been doing these so-called cleansing rituals, but we were constantly violating the taboo consistently, pulling in disordered energy and putting ourselves in a disordered condition. No different than somebody taking off, changing their diet, exercising, getting enough sleep and everything else, but yet they're still eating that one food that's been causing them problems the whole time. So no amount of, you know, lifestyle change will um, affect that in a positive capacity until they stop consuming that, which is an out. So... That's why that root chakra is for cock cry is key with regard to the unsamafo. So again, as we said earlier, um, when you look at the um, abosom of the seven days of the week and the various articles we did on them, um, you'll see that detailed information. So we have a call on the phone line. Uh, Michiawo on the phone line number 5251. We had a question or a comment. Michawo, um, yeah, I had a question on um, celibacy. Um, the last broadcast, I didn't get a chance to call in, so I didn't get a chance to ask you um, about the physical body and health. Um, now, you were saying that if you're married or if you're in a relationship with an African woman or African male, if you're a woman, and you're married and you engage in um, sexual um, intimacy without procreation, or ritual practices than a disorder, or you you basically only supposed to um, have intercourse if you have any kid. So I wanted to ask you for um, people who may not be able to, um, or who 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 don't who might not agree with that, or they might not be able to um, do, um, engage in celibacy for whatever reason. Um, would that repel their uh, or cry, or? Um, Stop them from being able to communicate with the non non Um or, or would you become a spirit of disorder? Um, as far as um, if you're in a relationship or whatever, and you're engaging in non procreative um, activity or rich. So, 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 basically, I wanted to ask you, like, is it um, would that, you know, make you a spirit of disorder? Basically, like, if you you can't stop for whatever reason, or you just feel like you know. I mean, if you're if you're in a um, relationship, that's my question. Okay, so just to, just to clarify, when we're talking. There are two forms of um, ritual procreative activity. One form is, of course, people you know um, get together and they engage in procreative activity, and they bring an ancestral spirit back into the world, a male or female ancestral spirit. That's one form of ritual procreative activity because you're bringing literally, whether people know it or not, they're bringing an ancestor or ancestors back. So it behooves us to engage in that, that process in an um, aware fashion. So we are not engaged in perversity. We're not engaged in lust and so forth, the kind of ancestor or ancestress that we're drawing back into the world is one that, you know, is one of harmony and so forth, so that kind of thing. So on one hand, ritual procreative activity brings an ancestor or ancestress back into the world. Now, even for people who are married couples, the vast majority of the time that they engage in procreative activity or sexual activity and so forth, is not to bring an ancestor or ancestors back in the world. If they had two or three kids, then only two or three times they're bringing, you know, over the course of decades of being married, they're, they're bringing an ancestral spirit back into the world. So 99% of the time when they're engaged in procreative activity, it's still, it can still be ritual procreative activity. They're just not bringing an ancestral spirit back into the world. They're engaged in generating that kind of energy 
to align themselves spiritually. If you're going to arouse that kind of energy, it behooves us to utilize it in a harmonious fashion. No different than ritual song, no different than ritual dance, no different than meditation, no different than any other ritual practice where somebody's playing drums and somebody begins to dance and they spin and they get possessed by the abosom or an abosom comes forth. Um, That's a ritual to generate energy to align ourselves with the forces of nature. Just like you can do that with ritual dance, just like you can do that with ritual song, just like you can do that with ritual prayer, incantation, in the same fashion you can do that with ritual procreative activity. So there are two forms of ritual procreative activity. Either you're using it to, you know, as a couple, married couple, to align yourself harmoniously um, with the abosom and attune yourself, your spirit body and so forth, your spiritual organs to tune them up, no different than working out and you're strengthening your physical body. Um, ritual song, ritual dance, and these other various rituals are ways to attune your spirit body. So you're either doing that or you're bringing an ancestral spirit in the world. Either way, that's, if you're not doing either one of those, if you're not trying to bring an ancestral spirit back into the world, or you're not engaged in that process to a, both of you to align yourself in a harmonious fashion, you're just generating the energy just simply for lustful purposes, and that's it. Um, then, of course, that's a misuse of the energy. It's no different than somebody eating some food to nourish themselves. So they go out and get some you know, they, they're hungry, they need some food, they get the food to nourish themselves. But then some people, or they get some water, it's cold outside, or it's hot outside, they're sweating, they need to replenish themselves, so they get some water to replenish themselves, that, that's normal. They fill themselves back up, they satisfy themselves, they replenish their energy. Or they get some food and they replenish their energy. But then some people will go and say, it's hot outside, let me go get some alcohol. Let me go get some beer, get some whiskey, get some scotch, get some whatever it is, and pollute themselves. Or they just want to get drunk. They just want to feel high. Or they go smoke some weed because they want to feel high. They're destroying their body, but they just want to feel something. Or they eat some food that they know that's not really good for them, but they like the way it tastes, so they're going to eat it anyway. They develop obesity or they develop other problems and so forth. They're not eating food simply to nourish themselves and strengthen themselves and become better as a result of that. They're just lusting after the taste, but it's not actually doing them any good. So in the same fashion, some of our people simply engage in sexual activity just because of the way it feels on a sensory level, but they're arousing the life force energy of Ra and Ra'et, the residual energy of Ra and Ra'et, just to make themselves feel good for a certain moment, but once that energy is aroused, they're not utilizing it to align themselves where they have been disaligned. If you're going to utilize or generate that kind of energy, it will behoove you to, you know, find um, areas of disorder and to realign yourself with order if you're going to raise that kind of energy. But if you don't, if it's just simply for lustful practices, then that's Separate from what the the abosom will help you participate in lust or misguided desire, they'll help you with ritual practice, but not if you're just lusting after somebody. So it becomes no different than somebody overeating or somebody, you know, engaging in, you know, drugs and everything else just to do something to make you feel good, but you're not utilizing the process, whether it's eating food or engaging in that activity, to do something positive. So so it's no different than somebody who gets in, trapped into the cycle of eating food that makes them feel good, and then once it wears off, they go get some more food to make them feel good, and they, their health begins to deteriorate. The same thing happens with the spirit body. You cut yourself off from the influence of the abosom, um, and therefore you're, just, you're utilizing the residual electromagnetic energy moving through your nervous system. You utilize it to make yourself feel stimulated for a short period of time, then that wears off, then you go back and do the same thing again, and then that wears off, you do the same thing again, and that wears off, and your mind gets trapped in a cycle of seeking out lust as opposed to seeking out law. So that's that's the difference. Right. So that with that, um for people who engage in their lifestyle, like um their whole life or whatever and then they pass on, um, 
would they lose there or cry from that? They were like, or they, you know what I'm saying? Like, or would they, um, now, would they lose their or cry? And also, is that, um, as far as ritual practices and that type of um, activity, this sounds like something like Tantra or something. Like you're saying, um, like ritual practices, like similar to Tantra, would be lawful or or um, conserving your seed. Because, you know, people in the country, they talk about um, males conserving their seed if they're not procreating with the woman that you could you could engage in that um process but just don't um you know spill your seed or whatever i mean is it would that like is it is it something like that or would it, i mean how do you how do you find out those type of ritual practices like you know like cuz what i'm saying is that if you marry or whatever to a woman or whatever and the only time you can engage in um that process is through procreation and you had three or four kids and then anything outside of that, and then you married 40, 50 years or whatever, and then you only engage in that process four times, and then that's it. You living with, you know, your spouse or whatever, and then you're not, you're, you're not interacting on that level, and then and there's only four times in 40 years or whatever. Like, no, no, the average male or the average person, they wouldn't be able to, um, you know, live like that or whatever. So, no, no, you see for, what I'm Remember, remember what I said in the beginning. The, I said it's two forms of ritual procreative activity. The less than 1% of the time, like, if, like you said, somebody's married for 40 years. If they have four kids, that means four times they brought an ancestral spirit back into the world, right? So right. the other 99 plus percent of the time that they're engaged in sexual activity, they're not doing it to bring an ancestral spirit back into the world. They're doing it as a husband and wife, but if they're intelligent and they are harmonious, every time they engage in sexual activity, they may engage in sexual activity every single day without trying to have a kid, but if they're focused, they would still utilize that energy in a harmonious spiritual way to help themselves. So that's still ritual procreative activity. And and let me let me say this first. Just like somebody, the only time somebody loses their crop is when they're like, you know, they're like engaged in criminal type stuff. The vast majority of people, even when they're not living in harmony, living in harmony with order and stuff like that, and they're just kind of controlled by lust or they used to drink or smoke and do all the stuff, other stuff and didn't really care about anything, but they weren't like criminals. They're neglecting their cross. Their cross still there. They're just not listening to it. So when they make their transition, there's people who neglected their cross, but they're they, they're the same way they were when they were here. They weren't robbing anybody. They weren't killing anybody, murdering anybody, anything like that. They were just kind of less lackadaisical, kind of, you know, idle, kind of self-destructive in a sense, not very ambitious or whatever, and just kind of controlled by lust, and they make their transition the same way. They were neglecting the crowd, but it's still connected to them. So when they just finally pay attention and align with it, then they will enhance themselves. If they don't, they'll still stay on that kind of weak, lower-level vibration, but they, they won't lose their crop. The only people who are losing their crop, that's a very small percentage that are engaged in, you know, perversity, people who are, you know, rapists and murderers and just sexuals and everything else. That's a, that's the, a very small percentage of the, you know, of, of our people. So, okay. so just to make, make that clear. So, um, but with regard to the procreative activity, if somebody, say, for example, you have somebody involved in ancestral culture and they, they're, you know, serious about, you know, doing what they need to do and nation building and things like that. They get married, um, say they have three children, three times in, in the course of their, you know, 20-year marriage up to this point, they engage in ritual procreative activity, simply meaning they brought an ancestral spirit back into the world. The rest of that 20 years, every time they engage in sexual activity, which may have been five times a week or something like that, it was still ritual, procreative activity. They just weren't trying to bring an ancestral spirit back in the world. They were engaged in sexual activity as a husband and a wife, and every time they were engaged in it, they were focused on generating that energy for a harmonious purpose as opposed to just being lustful. So that's still 
expropriative activity, and it does it does not have to be what the whites and their offspring call <clears throat> what they call tantric practices. For example, like you mentioned, the whole notion of somebody retaining their seed and everything else to preserve their chi, or you'll listen to Asians talking about, you know, everybody's born with a certain amount of prenatal chi, and you want to conserve it because you don't want to, every time you release your seed, then you, you're releasing some of that prenatal chi, and some people don't conserve it, and then they age quicker and all of this other stuff, right? So, of course, that has no basis in reality. Crackers may have, including Asians, may have a um, a little bit of electromagnetic energy that they're born with and they're trying to hold on to. But our energy is constantly replenished because we're connected to Ra and Ra'ed, and they constantly replenish our Ba and our Ba'ed, our divine living energy. So we're not dependent on trying to hold on to a little tiny, um, finite amount of electromagnetic energy that we're born with because we're connected to the forces in nature, and the Asians are not. So they create a whole perverse practice about trying to preserve a little bit of energy because they're so fearful of losing the energy that they have. That has nothing to do with us. That, that shows a clear distinction between us and them. We are not them, and they are not us. They can't do what we do. So whether we release right. the seed or not, we're going to be replenished by Ra and Ra. They can't communicate with us. So even just a basic male and female married and they engage in sexual activity, just it's no different than, for example, if a black person sits down in front of a shrine, if they pour libation and then sits down in front of a shrine and to engage in susu home meditation. Somebody on the outside looking in would just see them sitting there looking quiet and breathing slow with their eyes closed. But they're actually having experiences learning directly from our both home and Intimapo who are coming to them and showing them different things and they're, you know, aligning their thoughts with that so they can engage in proper behavior. And somebody else comes along and tries to imitate what they're doing. They sit down with their eyes closed and they don't see anything. Maybe one of their corrupt deceased relatives and that's it. We're doing something different than they're doing. Same thing happens with procreative activity. A male and female married, they get together, they may not be trying to have a child, but when they get engage in sexual activity in a harmonious fashion, they're still, because they're focused on the abosom that govern them, they will be informed and influenced in the process by the abosom that govern them without any elaborate ritual in the process, just engaged in procreative activity that the average person would think they just were just having sex as a married couple, but they were internally, they were actually aligning their ba and ba'at with the rye and rye and replenishing it. The whites and their offspring, if, like if they, if somebody, you know, caught them on a camera or something, they would think they were just engaged in, you know, sexual activity like just, just like somebody else, but they were not. They were actually engaged in a ritual process that somebody from the outside looking in couldn't see. Just like somebody from the outside looking in, watching one of us engage in meditation, they can't see what's happening with us because they can't experience that. So it's the same thing with that. It doesn't have to be all these you know, elaborate rituals that the white and spring put forward and, and label Tantra. Tantra, of course, comes from black people in ancient um, India, but it's no different than what our people do everywhere around the world. All this extra stuff that the white Hindus and then Asians and other people and Western Eurasians have added to these things, that's all new manufactured nonsense. We have an ancestral culture that's unbroken, and it's not dependent on the misinformation that they put forward and label cancer and everything else. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, I mean, Don, say for clarifying that, because maybe I misheard you on the other broadcast. I thought you said, or maybe I misheard you say that um, you can only engage in um, um, intimate activity if you want to bring an ancestral spirit back in the world, and then that's it. I, okay, so now I understand. Um so when you're saying focusing on the abosom while engaged in that process, I mean, we just you just have the um, thinking on um, what harmonious thoughts, and then then that's that's enough to be engaged in. Like, like how do you find out about the actual ritual practices that will put you in um, harmony with order while you engage in that process? Just 
just thinking, just focusing and meditating on the about your cry while you're in that pro like yeah, yes. In fact, it extends from when you first it extends from when you go to your own shrine for your crowd, when you sit down and um, meditate with your own crowd on a regular basis. Then you begin to develop a relationship with your crowd, which is an abosom in and of itself. So then, when you engage in any ritual practice beyond that, whether it's ritual song, if you went to some ritual and people were playing drums and stuff like that, or ritual dance, or a ritual prayer, or whatever, what you do at your shrine with your craft, your own meditation, it will extend to those different ritual practices, and you will know how to invoke your craft because you've been doing it on a regular basis. You do it on a daily basis or a weekly basis yourself anyway. So then when you engage in some other ritual practice that gives it a little extra energy, when the drums start playing or people start, you know, singing or clapping, whatever, or if you engage in procreative activity or whatever, once that extra energy is, comes into play to boost, boost that, you already know how to align with your crop. So it's just an extension of that. It's just another way to do that. Or if um, you all would, you know. So, so you know, it, it starts out with that. So the more you okay. become familiar with your own crop, then when you engage in other ritual practices, then it will be an extension of that practice. Okay, that, that clarifies everything. May God say, thank you very much for that. Good night. Okay, you know, I said I appreciate the call. Okay. okay. So, um, all right, so we didn't realize it was 11.53. So, um, what we want to, what you want to do with regard to that, read, the, read our book, Ankh, The Origin of the Term Yoga, Karakasa, the origin and nature of the chakra, which we were reading some of the excerpts today, because we go into detail about the difference between, of course, we properly identify the term yoga, but what it really is and what it really is not. Talking about yoga is a different discipline, no, no, it's not. So the term yoke to yoke or yonk is a corruption of yonk or ank. Ank means life. So if somebody says, I practice yoga, it, are you, they're saying you're, they're practicing life. They really know what the term means. So now you have to reassess what people are engaged in, what's really happening, and what does the term ankh really mean. In fact, ankh is also a divinity. So are you practicing a divinity in reality? So read the origin of the term yoga, the origin and nature of the chakra and so forth. Read through that book and you'll get that detailed information with regard to ritual practice and the nature of ritual practice and its value, um, check out our book, Who Been Shang, The Ancestral Summon, as well as the related videos associated with that, and then you'll see um, what we're dealing with. And the question in the chat room, yes, yeah, so um, it says, spinning off from the call's question, I understand that the tantric corruption of procreative techniques, but do, do did we practice generating the abosone's presence by technique? of Aboa, like in what is misnomer yoga. So, right, so what, for example, when we talk about Aboa and Kwa, um, for example, ritual song and ritual dance, when you see people engage in ritual dance and they move in the movements of the hawk or the serpent or something, and then they get possessed by an Abosom or something like that, and they move in the movements of these animal totems, it's pulling in the energy of these abosom. You're dealing with spirit possession, akam, or spirit communication, unkam. Either way, you're invoking abosom through certain specific ritual practices. That's a different thing from somebody just doing some postures and breathing and meditating on escaping the cycle of reincarnation, which is nonsense. So, yes, there's a, there's a clear difference. But we go into detail about that in the, off the origin of the term yoga book. So that's one of our publications. The ebook version of that is free. And then, of course, we also sell the soft cover version, which is uh, that, one, that one in particular is nine. So all of our 16 books on the various subjects that we publish on, the ebook versions are free. When you go to the publications page, um, you'll see that the, we also have the soft cover versions, and they all range between $8 and $11. And any order of uh, 10 books or more is 30% off automatically. And that's a permanent discount. So, again, yet I say for everyone tuning in to the show, 
If you have any questions or comments, send us an email via our website. Also, Facebook. We're OG.fo on Facebook. You can also type in Kwesiakan or Afuraka Afuraikai. Um, OG.fo on Twitter. OG.fo on Instagram. OG.fo, of course, on Blog Talk Radio. Follow us on these various ne- networks so you can get updates on information and the new books that we are publishing and releasing, as well as the places that, what cities that we will be um, coming to to teach and so forth, and all updates. So, again, Yedase, we thank you for tuning in to the show. We will be back on tomorrow. We will send out a notification for that. And Yebeshia Bio, we will meet again. Good job.